In life's journey, we often find ourselves at the crossroads of reality and desire, wondering if there is a master key that can unlock the mysteries of the universe, a key that allows us not only to understand, but also to create the reality we long for. This extraordinary work invites us to explore just that, revealing to us that this key has always been within us, in our beliefs, our thoughts, and above all, in our faith. Here, we enter a world where words are not mere sounds or letters, but powerful instruments of creation. We discover that I am is not just an affirmation of existence, but a pronouncement of infinite power, a recognition of our inherent divinity and our ability to shape reality. This work guides us through the realization that we are, in essence, architects of our destiny, sculpting our lives not only through actions, but also through consciousness. Each chapter takes us deeper into the understanding that our most deeply held beliefs and our deepest convictions are the seeds of the experiences we live. It teaches us that by changing our inner perception, by transforming our inner dialogue, we are not only changing our view of the world, but also the world itself. This book is a journey towards the revelation that the ancient scriptures and spiritual teachings are not mere stories or dogmas, but powerful allegories and universal truths that reflect the nature of our consciousness and reality. Through a profound reinterpretation of these sacred texts, we are shown how each story, each parable, is a mirror of our own life, a guide to navigate the seas of existence. The work invites us to a profound self-inquiry and personal transformation. It challenges us to look beyond external appearances and to recognize that, at the core of our being, lies unlimited power. It encourages us to take control of this power, to affirm our true nature, and to consciously manifest the life we desire. Thus, we find ourselves before an invitation not only to read, but to live the teachings presented in these pages. An invitation to transform our doubts into certainties, our fears into strengths, and our hopes into realities. We are on the threshold of an awakening, where every affirmation, every thought, and every act of faith brings us closer to the life we have always dreamed of. This book is not just a reading, it is a transformative experience, a journey towards the discovery of the most sublime and sacred power, the power of our own consciousness. It is an exploration of the soul, a revelation of the spirit, and an unfolding of the unlimited potential that resides in each of us. Prepare to embark on an adventure that will change not only how you see the world, but how you interact with it. An adventure that invites you to discover and embrace the greatest power you have ever known, the power that resides in I am. Your faith is your fortune. Neville Goddard. Chapter 1. Before Abraham was. Verily I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. John 8, 58. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was the unconditioned consciousness of being, and the unconditioned consciousness of being was conditioned by imagining itself to be something, and the unconditioned consciousness of being became that which it had imagined itself to be. Thus began creation. By this law, first conceiving, then becoming that which was conceived, all things evolve out of nothing, and without this sequence there is nothing done that is done. Before Abraham or the world was, I am. When all time ceases to be, I am. I am the formless consciousness of being conceiving myself as man. By my eternal law of being, I am bound to be and express all that I believe myself to be. I am the eternal nothingness that contains within my formless being the capacity to be all things. I am that in which all my conceptions of myself live and move and have their being, and apart from which they are not. I dwell within every conception of myself. From this inwardness I ever seek to transcend all conceptions of myself. By the very law of my being, I transcend my conceptions of myself, only to the extent that I believe myself to be that which I transcend. I am the law of being, and outside of me there is no law. I am that I am. Chapter 2. Thou shalt decree. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in that for which I sent it. Isaiah 55. 11. Man can decree a thing, and it will come to pass. 
Man has always decreed what has appeared in his world. Today, he is decreeing what is appearing in his world and will continue to do so as long as man is conscious of being man. Nothing has ever appeared in man's world that has not been decreed by man. This you may deny, but try as you may, you cannot disprove it. For this decree is based on an immutable principle. Man does not command things to appear by his words, which are, more often than not, a confession of his doubts and fears. It is always decreed in conscience. Every man automatically expresses what he is conscious of being. Without effort or use of words, at all times, man commands himself to be and to possess what he is conscious of being and possessing. This immutable principle of expression is dramatized in all the Bibles of the world. The writers of our sacred books were enlightened mystics, masters in the art of psychology. In telling the story of the soul, they embodied this impersonal principle in the form of a historical document, both to preserve it and to hide it from the eyes of the uninitiated. Today, those to whom this great treasure has been entrusted, namely, the priesthoods of the world, have forgotten that the Bibles are psychological dramas representing the consciousness of man. In their blind forgetfulness, they now teach their followers to worship their characters as men and women who actually lived in time and space. When man sees the Bible as a great psychological drama, with all its characters and actors, as the personified qualities and attributes of his own consciousness, then, and only then, will the Bible reveal to him the light of its symbology. This impersonal principle of life that made all things is personified as God. This Lord God, creator of heaven and earth, is discovered as man's consciousness of being. If man were less bound by orthodoxy, and more intuitively observant, he could not fail to notice in reading the Bibles that the consciousness of being is revealed hundreds of times throughout this literature. To cite a few, I am has sent me to you. Be still and know that I am God. I am the Lord and there is no God. I am the shepherd. I am the door. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way. I am the beginning and the end. I am, the unconditioned consciousness of man's being, is revealed as Lord and Creator of every conditioned state of being. If man would renounce his belief in a God apart from himself, recognize that his consciousness of being is God, this consciousness fashions itself in the likeness and image of his conception of himself, he would transform his world from a barren wasteland into a fertile field to his liking. The day man does this, he will know that he and his father are one, but that his father is greater than he. He will know that his consciousness of being is one with that of which he is conscious of being, but that his unconditioned consciousness of being is greater than his conditioned state or his conception of himself. When man discovers that his consciousness is the impersonal power of expression, power which is eternally embodied in his conceptions of himself, he will assume and appropriate that state of consciousness which he desires to express. In so doing, he will become that state in expression. Ye shall decree a thing, and it shall come to pass. May now be said in this way, you will be conscious of being or possessing a thing, and you will express or possess what you are conscious of being. The law of consciousness is the only law of expression. I am the way. I am the resurrection. Consciousness is the way as well as the power that resurrects and expresses all that man will ever be conscious of being. Turn away from the blindness of the uninitiated man who attempts to express and possess those qualities and things which he is not conscious of being and possessing, and be as the enlightened mystic who decrees on the basis of this immutable law. Consciously affirm that you are that which you seek. Appropriate the consciousness of that which you see, and you too will know the condition of the true mystic as follows. I became conscious of being. I am still conscious of being so, and I will continue to be conscious of being so until what I am conscious of being is perfectly expressed. Yes, I will decree a thing and it will be realized. Chapter 3. The Principle of Truth. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 32. The truth that makes man free 
is the knowledge that his consciousness is resurrection and life, that his consciousness resurrects and gives life to all that it is conscious of being. Apart from consciousness, there is neither resurrection nor life. When man abandons his belief in a god apart from himself and begins to recognize that his consciousness of being is God, as did Jesus and the prophets, he will transform his world with the realization, I and my father are one, but my father is greater than I. He will know that his consciousness is God and that what he is conscious of being is the son who bears witness to God the father. The conceiver and the conception are one, but the conceiver is greater than his conception. Before Abraham was I am. Yes, I was conscious of being before, I was conscious of being a man. And on that day when I cease to be conscious of being a man, I will continue to be conscious of being. The consciousness of being does not depend on being anything. It preceded all conceptions of itself and will be when all conceptions of itself cease to be. I am the beginning and the end. That is to say, all things or conceptions of myself begin and end in me, but I, the formless consciousness, remain forever. Jesus discovered this glorious truth and declared himself one with God, not with the God that man had created, for he never recognized such a God. Jesus discovered that God was his consciousness of being and thus told man that the kingdom of God and heaven were within him. When it is said that Jesus left the world and went to his Father, it is simply saying that he turned his attention away from the world of the senses and raised his consciousness to the level he wished to express. There he remained until he became one with the consciousness to which he had ascended. When he returned to the world of men, he was able to act with the positive assurance of what he was conscious of being, a state of consciousness which none but he felt or knew he possessed. Man, ignorant of this eternal law of expression, regards such events as miracles, to rise in consciousness to the level of the thing desired and to remain there until such a level becomes your nature, is the way of all apparent miracles. And I, if I am elevated, will draw all to me. If I am elevated in consciousness to the naturalness of the thing desired, I will draw to me the manifestation of that desire. No one comes to me unless the Father in me draws him, and I and my Father are one. My consciousness is the Father who draws to me the manifestation of life. The nature of manifestation is determined by the state of consciousness in which I dwell. I am always drawing into my world that which I am conscious of being. If you are not satisfied with your present expression of life, then you must be born again. To be reborn is to leave the level you are dissatisfied with and rise to the level of consciousness you wish to express and possess. You cannot serve two opposite masters or states of consciousness at the same time. If you remove your attention from one state and place it on the other, you die to the one from which you have removed it and live and express the one with which you are united. Man cannot see how it would be possible to express that which he wishes to be by such a simple law as acquiring the consciousness of the thing desired. The reason for this lack of faith on the part of man is that he looks at the desired state through the consciousness of his present limitations. Therefore, he naturally sees it as impossible to attain. One of the first things man must realize is that it is impossible in dealing with this spiritual law of consciousness to put new wine into old bottles or new patches into old clothes. That is to say, no part of the present consciousness can be brought into the new state, for the state sought is complete in itself and needs no patching. Each level of consciousness expresses itself automatically. To rise to the level of any state is to automatically become that state in expression. But to rise to the level that you are not now expressing, you must completely abandon the consciousness with which you are now identified. Until you abandon your present consciousness, you will not be able to rise to another level. Do not be discouraged. This abandonment of your present identity is not as difficult as it may seem. The scriptural invitation, absent from the body and be present with the Lord, is not given to a select few. It is a broad call to all mankind. The body from which you are invited to escape is your present conception of yourself with all its limitations, while the Lord with whom you are to be present is your consciousness of being.
To accomplish this seemingly impossible feat, turn your attention away from your problem and place it simply on being. You say silently, but with feeling, I am. Do not condition this awareness, but continue to state quietly, I am, I am. Just feel that you are faceless and formless and continue to do so until you feel yourself floating. Floating is a psychological state that completely negates the physical. Through the practice of relaxation and willingly refusing to react to sensory impressions, it is possible to develop a state of consciousness of pure receptivity. It is a surprisingly easy accomplishment. In this state of complete detachment, a definite oneness of purposeful thought can be indelibly etched into your unmodified consciousness. This state of consciousness is necessary for true meditation. This wonderful experience of rising and floating is the sign that you are absent from the body or problem and are now present with the Lord. In this expanded state, you are not conscious of being anything other than I am, I am. You are only conscious of being. When you reach this expansion of consciousness, within this formless depth of yourself, shape the new conception by claiming and feeling yourself to be that which, before you entered this state, you desired to be. You will find that within this formless depth of yourself all things seem divinely possible. Whatever you sincerely feel you are while in this expanded state becomes, in time, your natural expression. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Yes, let there be a firmness or conviction in the midst of this expanded consciousness, in knowing and feeling I am that, the thing desired. As you affirm and feel that you are the thing desired, you are crystallizing this formless liquid light that you are into the image and likeness of that which you are conscious of being. Now that the law of your being has been revealed to you, begin this day to change your world by revaluing yourself. Too long has man clung to the belief that he is born of sorrow and must earn his salvation by the sweat of his brow. God is impersonal and is no respecter of persons. As long as man continues to walk in this belief of sorrow, so long will he walk in a world of sorrow and confusion, for the world in its every detail is the crystallized consciousness of man. In the book of Numbers, it is recorded, There were giants in the land, and we were in our own eyes as grasshoppers, and in their eyes we were as grasshoppers. Today is the day, the eternal now, when conditions in the world have reached the appearance of giants, the unemployed, the armies of the enemy, the business competition, etc., are the giants that make you feel like a helpless grasshopper. We are told that in the beginning we were, in our own sight, helpless grasshoppers, and that, because of this conception of ourselves, we were to the enemy helpless grasshoppers. We can only be to others what we are to ourselves. Therefore, as we revalue ourselves and begin to feel ourselves the giant, a center of power, we automatically change our relationship with the giants, reducing these former monsters to their true place, making them look like the helpless grasshoppers. Paul said of this principle, to the Greeks, or so-called worldly wise men, it is foolishness, and to the Jews or sign seekers a stumbling block, with the result that man continues to walk in darkness instead of awakening to the realization, I am the light of the world. Man has so long worshipped the images of his own creation that at first this revelation seems blasphemous to him. But the day man discovers and accepts this principle as the basis of his life, that day man puts to death his belief in a God apart from himself. The story of Jesus' betrayal in the Garden of Gethsemane is the perfect illustration of man's discovery of this principle. We are told that the crowd, armed with sticks and lanterns, searched for Jesus in the darkness of the night. As they inquired as to the whereabouts of Jesus, salvation, the voice answered, I am. Then the whole crowd fell to the ground. As they regained their composure, they again asked to be shown the hiding place of the Savior, and again the Savior said, I have told you that I am, therefore, if you seek me, leave all else. Man, in the darkness of human ignorance, undertakes the search for God, aided by the flickering light of human wisdom. When it is revealed to man that his I am or consciousness of being is his Savior, the shock is so great that he mentally falls to the ground, for every belief he has harbored collapses as he realizes that his consciousness is the only Savior. The knowledge that his I am is God forces man to let go of all others 
for it is impossible for him to serve two gods. Man cannot accept his godlike consciousness and at the same time believe in another deity. With this discovery, man's human ear or hearing understanding is cut off by the sword of faith, Peter, while his perfect disciplined hearing, understanding, is restored by Jesus, the knowledge that I am, is Lord and Saviour. Before man can transform his world, he must first lay this foundation or understanding, I am the Lord. Man must know that his consciousness of being is God. Until this is firmly established, so that no suggestion or argument from others can shake him, he will find himself returning to the bondage of his former belief. If ye believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. Unless man discovers that his consciousness is the cause of every expression of his life, he will continue to seek the cause of his confusion in the world of effects, and thus die in his fruitless search. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Consciousness is the vine, and what you are conscious of being is like branches that you nurture and keep alive. Just as a branch has no life unless it is rooted in the vine, so things have no life unless you are conscious of them. Just as a branch withers and dies if the sap of the vine stops flowing into it, so things and qualities pass away if you turn your attention away from them. For your attention is the sap of life that sustains the expression of your life. Chapter 4. Whom seek ye? I have told you that I am. If, therefore, ye seek me, let these go their way. John 18, 8. As soon as he said unto them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. John 18, 6. There is so much talk today of masters, elder brothers, adepts and initiates that countless seekers of truth are constantly misled into seeking these false lights. For a price, most of these pseudo-teachers offer their students' initiation into the mysteries, promising them guidance and direction. Man's weakness for leaders, as well as his worship of idols, makes him easy prey to these schools and teachers. Good will come to most of these enrolled students. They will discover after years of waiting and sacrifice that they were following a mirage. They will then become disillusioned with their schools and teachers, and this disillusionment will be worth the effort and price they have paid for their fruitless pursuit. Then they will turn away from their worship of man, and, in so doing, they will discover that what they seek is not to be found in another, for the kingdom of heaven is within them. This realization will be their first real initiation. The lesson learned will be this. There is only one master, and this master is God, the I Am within themselves. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of darkness, out of the house of bondage. I am your consciousness is Lord and Master, and outside of your consciousness there is neither Lord nor Master. You are the master of all that you will ever be conscious of being. You know you are, don't you? Knowing that you are is the Lord and Master of what you know you are. You could be completely cut off by man from what you are conscious of being. Yet, in spite of all human barriers, you would effortlessly attract to yourself all that you were conscious of being. The man who is conscious of being poor does not need anyone's help to express his poverty. The man who is conscious of being sick, even if he is isolated in the most hermetically sealed germ-proof place in the world, would express sickness. There is no barrier to God, because God is your consciousness of being. Whatever you are conscious of being, you can and do express it effortlessly. Stop looking for the Master to come, he is always with you. I am with you all the days until the end of the world. From time to time you will know that you are many things, but you need not be anything to know that you are. You can, if you so desire, disentangle yourself from the body you wear. In doing so you realize that you are a faceless, formless consciousness, and that you are not dependent on the form you are in your expression. You will know that you are. You will also discover that this knowing that you are is God the Father, who preceded everything you ever knew yourself to be. Before the world existed, you were conscious of being, and that is why you said, I am, and I am will be. After all that you know you are ceases to be. There are no ascended masters. Banish this superstition. You will forever rise from one level of consciousness, master, to another. In doing so, you manifest the ascended level.
expressing this newly acquired consciousness. Consciousness being Lord and Master, you are the Master Magician, conjuring that which you are now conscious of being. For God, consciousness, calls things that are not as though they were. Things now unseen will be seen the moment you are conscious of being that which is now unseen. This elevation from one level of consciousness to another is the only ascension you will ever experience. No man can raise you to the level you desire. The power to ascend is within you. It is your consciousness. You appropriate the consciousness of the level you wish to express by affirming that you are now expressing that level. This is ascension. It is unlimited, for you will never exhaust your capacity to ascend. Turn away from the human superstition of ascension with its belief in masters and find the one eternal master within you. Far greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Believe this. Do not continue in blindness following the mirage of masters. I assure you that your search can only end in disappointment. If you deny me, your consciousness of self, I will also deny you. Thou shalt have no other God besides me. Be still and know that I am God. Come and try me and see if I do not open the windows of heaven for you and pour you a blessing, that there will not be room enough to receive it. Do you think the I am is capable of doing this? Then claim me to be that which you want to see poured out. Claim yourself to be what you want to be and what you will be. Not because of teachers will I give it to you, but because you have acknowledged me yourself to be that, I will give it to you because I am all things to all. Jesus did not allow himself to be called good teacher. He knew that there is but one good and one master. He knew that this was his Father in heaven, the consciousness of being. The kingdom of God, the good, and the kingdom of heaven are within you. Your belief in masters is a confession of your bondage. Only slaves have masters. Change your conception of yourself and... Without the help of masters or anyone else, you will automatically transform your world to fit your new conception of yourself. In the Book of Numbers, you are told that there was a time when men were in their own eyes like grasshoppers, and because of this conception of themselves, they saw giants in the earth. This is as true of man today as it was in the day when it was recorded. Man's conception of himself is so much like that of a grasshopper that he automatically makes the conditions around him seem gigantic. In his blindness, he cries out for teachers to help him struggle with his gigantic problems. Jesus tried to show the man that salvation was within himself and warned him not to look for his Savior in places or people. If someone comes saying, look here or look there, do not believe him, because the kingdom of heaven is within you. Jesus not only refused to allow himself to be called good teacher, but warned his followers Greet no one on the way. He made it clear that they were not to acknowledge any authority or superior other than God, the Father. Jesus established the identity of the Father as man's consciousness of being. I and my Father are one, but my Father is greater than I. I am one with all that I am conscious of being. I am greater than that which I am conscious of being. The Creator is always greater than His creation. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. The serpent symbolizes the present conception of man as a worm from the dust, living in the wilderness of human confusion. Just as Moses rose from his conception of himself as a worm from the dust to discover that God was his consciousness of being, I am has sent me, so you must be lifted up. The day you affirm, like Moses, I am that I am. That day, your affirmation will blossom in the wilderness. Your consciousness is the master magician who conjures all things by being that which he would conjure. This Lord and master that you are can and does make appear in your world all that you are conscious of being. No one manifestation comes to me without my father drawing him and I and my father are one. You are constantly drawing to you what you are conscious of being. Change your conception of yourself from that of a slave to that of Christ. Do not be ashamed to make this affirmation, only to the extent that you affirm, I am Christ, you will do the works of Christ. The works that I do, ye shall do also, and greater works than these shall ye do, because I go unto the Father. He made himself equal with God, and it seemed not robbery to him to do the works of God. Jesus knew that anyone who dared to proclaim himself Christ would automatically assume the capacities, 
to express the works of his conception of Christ. Jesus also knew that the exclusive use of this principle of expression did not belong to him alone. He constantly referred to his heavenly Father. He affirmed that his works would not only be equaled, but would be surpassed by that man who dared to conceive himself greater than he, Jesus, had conceived himself to be. Jesus, in affirming that he and his Father were one, but that his Father was greater than he, revealed that his consciousness, Father, was one with what he was conscious of being. He found himself as father or consciousness to be greater than what he as Jesus was conscious of being. You and your conception of yourself are one. You are and always will be greater than any conception you have of yourself. Man fails to do the works of Jesus Christ because he attempts to do them from his present level of consciousness. You will never transcend your present achievements through sacrifice and struggle. Your present level of consciousness will only be transcended when you leave the present state and rise to a higher level. You rise to a higher level of consciousness by turning your attention away from your present limitations and placing it on that which you wish to be. Do not attempt this by daydreaming or wishful thinking, but in a positive way. Assert yourself to be the thing you desire. I am that. No sacrifices, no diets, no human tricks. All that is asked of you is to accept your desire. If you dare to claim it, you will express it. Meditate on this. I do not rejoice in the sacrifices of men, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. Ask and you shall receive. Come, eat and drink without price. The works are finished. All that is required of you to let these qualities express themselves is the affirmation, I am that. Affirm yourself to be that which you desire to be and will be. Expressions follow impressions, they do not precede them. The proof that you are will follow the affirmation that you are, not precede it. Drop everything and follow me is a double invitation to you. First, it invites you to walk away completely from all problems and then, it calls you to keep walking in the affirmation that you are that which you desire to be. Don't be a lot woman who looks back and remains salty or preserved in the dead past. Be a lot who does not look back, but keeps her vision focused on the promised land, the desired. Do this, and you will know that you have found the master, the master magician, making the invisible visible through the command, I am that. Chapter 5. Who am I? But who do you say that I am I? Matthew 16, 15. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another. I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. This I am within you, reader, this consciousness, this awareness, this consciousness of being, is the Lord, the God of all flesh. I am is the one who must come. Stop looking for another. As long as you believe in a God apart from yourself, you will continue to transfer the power of your expression to your conceptions, forgetting that you are the one who conceives. The power to conceive and the thing conceived are one, but the power to conceive is greater than the conception. Jesus discovered this glorious truth when he declared, I and my Father are one, but my Father is greater than I. The power that conceives itself and the thing conceived are one, but the power to conceive is greater than the conception. The power that conceives itself as man is greater than its conception. All conceptions are limitations of the one who conceives them. Before Abraham was, I am. Before the world was, I am. Consciousness precedes all manifestations and is the prop upon which all manifestation rests. To eliminate manifestations, all that is required of you, the conceiver, is to turn your attention away from conception. Instead of eyes that do not see, heart that does not feel. It is actually eyes that do not feel, heart that does not feel. The manifestation will remain in sight only as long as it takes the force with which the conceiver, I am, originally endowed it to expend itself. This applies to all creation, from the infinitesimally small electron to the infinitely large universe. Be still and know that I am God. Yes, this same I am, your consciousness of being, is God, the only God. I am is the Lord, the God of all flesh, of all manifestation. This presence, your unconditioned consciousness, understands neither beginning nor end. 
limitations exist only in manifestation. When you realize that this consciousness is your eternal being, you will know that before Abraham was, I am. Begin to understand why you were told, go thou and do likewise. Begin now to identify with this presence, your consciousness, as the only reality. All manifestations only appear to be. You as man have no other reality than what your eternal being, I am, believes itself to be. Who do you say that I am? This is not a question asked 2,000 years ago. It is the eternal question addressed to manifestation by the Creator. It is your true self, your consciousness of being, asking you its current conception of itself. Who do you think your consciousness is? This answer can only be defined within yourself, independent of the influence of another. I am, your true self, is not interested in man's opinion. All his interest lies in your conviction of yourself. What do you say of the I am within you? Can you respond and say, I am Christ? Your answer or degree of understanding will determine the place you will occupy in life. Do you say or believe yourself to be a man of a certain family, race, nation, etc.? Do you sincerely believe this of yourself? Then life, your true self, will make these conceptions appear in your world and you will live with them as if they were real. I am the door. I am the way. I am the resurrection and the life. No man or manifestation comes to my Father but by me. The I am, your consciousness, is the only door through which anything can pass into your world. Stop looking for signs. Signs follow. They do not proceed. Start reversing the statement, seeing is believing, to believing is seeing. Begin now to believe, not with wavering confidence based on deceptive external evidence, but with undaunted confidence based on the immutable law that you can be what you wish to be. You will discover that you are not a victim of fate, but a victim of faith, your own. Only through a door can that which you seek pass into the world of manifestation. I am the door. Your consciousness is the door. So you must be conscious of being and having that which you desire to be and have. Any attempt to realize your desires other than through the doorway of consciousness makes you a thief and a thief to yourself. Any expression that is not felt is unnatural. Before anything appears, God, I am, feels himself as the thing desired, and then the thing felt appears. It is resurrected, raised from nothing. I am rich, poor, healthy, sick, free, confined, were first felt impressions or conditions before they became visible expressions. Your world is your objectified consciousness. Don't waste time trying to change the outside. Change the inside or impression, and the outside or expression will take care of itself. When you realize the truth of this statement, you will know that you have found the lost word or the key to all doors. I am your consciousness is the lost magic word that became flesh in the likeness of what you are conscious of being. I am him. Right now, I am overshadowing you, reader, my living temple, with my presence urging you to a new expression. Your desires are my spoken words. My words are spirit and they are true and they will not return to me empty, but will accomplish that to which they have been sent. They are not something to be elaborated. They are garments that I, your faceless and formless self, wear. Behold, I, clothed with your desire, stand at the door, your consciousness, and knock. If you hear my voice and open to me, recognize me as your savior, I will come into you and dine with you and you with me. How my words, your desires, will be fulfilled is none of your business. My words have a way that you do not know. Your ways are no longer discoverable. All that is required of you is that you believe. Believe that your desires are garments that your Savior wears. Your belief that you are now that which you wish to be is proof of your acceptance of the gifts of life. You have opened the door for your Lord, clothed in your desire, to enter the moment you establish this belief. When you pray, believe that you have received, and it will be so. All things are possible to him who believes. Make the impossible possible through your belief, and the impossible, for others, will be embodied in your world. All men have had proof of the power of faith. The faith that moves mountains is faith in yourself. 
No man has faith in God if he lacks confidence in himself. Your faith in God is measured by your confidence in yourself. I and my Father are one, man and his God are one, consciousness and manifestation are one. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. In the midst of all the doubts and changing opinions of others, let there be one conviction, one firmness of belief, and you will see the dry land. Your belief will appear. The reward is for the one who perseveres to the end. A conviction is not a conviction if it can be shaken. Your desire will be like clouds without rain unless you believe. Your unconditioned consciousness, or I am, is the Virgin Mary who knew no man, and yet, unaided by man, conceived and bore a son, Mary, the unconditioned consciousness, desired and then became conscious of being the conditioned state she wished to express, and in a way, unknown to others became him. Go and do the same. Assume the consciousness of that which you desire to be, and you too will give birth to your Saviour. When the Annunciation is made, when the impulse or desire is upon you, believe that it is the spoken word of God seeking incarnation through you. Go tell no one of this holy thing you have conceived. Lock your secret within you, and magnify the Lord, magnify or believe that your desire is your Saviour coming to be with you. When this belief is so firmly established that you feel sure of the results, your desire will be embodied. How it will be done, no one knows. I, your desire, have ways that you do not know. My ways cannot be discovered. Your desire can be compared to a seed, and seeds contain within themselves both the power and the plan of self-expression. Your consciousness is the soil. These seeds are planted successfully only if, having affirmed being and having what you desire, you confidently await the results without anxious thought. If I rise in consciousness to the naturalness of my desire, I will automatically attract manifestation to me. Consciousness is the door through which life reveals itself. Consciousness always objectifies itself. To be conscious of being or possessing something is to be or have that which you are conscious of being or possessing. Therefore, rise to the awareness of your desire and you will see it manifest automatically. To do this you must deny your present identity. Let it deny itself. You deny a thing by turning your attention away from it. To turn a thing, problem or ego away from consciousness, you stay in God. God being I am. Be still and know that I am is God. Believe, feel that I am. Know that this knower within you, your consciousness of being, is God. Close your eyes and feel yourself faceless, formless and formless. Approach this stillness as if it were the easiest thing in the world to achieve. This attitude will assure you success. When all thought of trouble or of self is removed from consciousness, because you are now absorbed or lost in the feeling of simply being I am, then begin in this formless state, to feel yourself as that which you wish to be, I am that I am. The moment you reach a certain degree of intensity, so that you really feel yourself to be a new conception, this new feeling or consciousness is established and in due course will become embodied in the world of form. This new perception will express itself as naturally as you now express your present identity. To express the qualities of a consciousness naturally, you must dwell or live within that consciousness, appropriate it by becoming one with it, feeling a thing intensely, and then resting confidently that it is, makes the thing felt appear within your world. I will stand upon my watch and see the salvation of the Lord. I will stand firmly upon my feeling, convinced that it is, and see my desire appear. A man can receive nothing, no thing, unless it is given to him from heaven. Remember that heaven is your consciousness. The kingdom of heaven is within you. That is why you are warned not to call any man father. Your conscience is the father of all that you are. Again, you are told, greet no man on the road. Do not look upon any man as an authority. Why should you ask man's permission to express yourself when you realize that your world, in its every detail, originated within you and is sustained by you, as its sole conceptual center. Your whole world can be likened to a solidified space, reflecting the beliefs and acceptances projected by a formless and faceless presence, i.e., I am. Reduce the whole to its primordial substance, and there will be nothing left but you, a dimensionless presence, the conceiver. The conceiver is a separate law. 
conceptions under such a law are not to be measured by past accomplishments or modified by present capacities because, without taking thought, the conception in a manner unknown to man expresses itself. Enter secretly and appropriate the new consciousness. Feel yourself as such, and the former limitations will disappear as completely and easily as snow on a hot summer day. You will not even remember the former limitations. They were never part of this new consciousness. This rebirth to which Jesus referred when he said to Nicodemus, you must be born again, was nothing more than passing from one state of consciousness to another. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. This certainly does not mean asking with words, uttering with the lips the sounds, God or Christ Jesus, for millions have asked in this way without results. To feel a thing is to have asked for that thing in his name. I am is the nameless presence. To feel rich is to ask for wealth in his name. I am is unconditional. He is neither rich nor poor, neither strong nor weak. In other words, in him there is neither Greek nor Jew, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female. All these are conceptions or limitations of the unlimited, and therefore names of the unnameable. To feel that you are something is to ask the unnameable, I am, to express that name or nature. Ask what you will in my name by appropriating the nature of the thing desired, and I will give it to you. Chapter 6. I am He. For if ye believe not that I am, ye shall die in your sins. John 8, 24. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made that was made. This is a difficult saying for those trained in the various orthodox systems of religion to accept, but there it is. All things, good, bad, and indifferent, were made by God. God made man, manifestation, in his own image, in the likeness of God, he made him. Apparently adding to this confusion, it is stated, and God saw that his creation was good. What is to be done with this apparent anomaly? How is man to correlate all things as good when what he is taught denies this fact? Either the understanding of God is wrong, or there is something radically wrong with man's teaching. To the pure, all things are pure. This is another puzzling statement. All good people, pure people, holy people, are the greatest prohibitionists. If we couple the above statement with this one, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus, we get an insurmountable barrier for the self-proclaimed judges of the world. Such statements mean nothing to the self-appointed judges who blindly change and destroy shadows. They continue in the firm belief that they are improving the world. Man, unaware that his world is his individual conscience portrayed, vainly strives to conform to the opinion of others instead of conforming to the only existing opinion, namely, his own judgment of himself. When Jesus discovered that his conscience was this wonderful law of self-government, he declared, And now I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified through the truth. He knew that consciousness was the only reality, that objectified things were but different states of consciousness. Jesus warned his followers to seek first the kingdom of heaven, that state of consciousness which would produce the thing desired, and all things would be added unto them. He also stated, I am the truth. He knew that man's consciousness was the truth or the cause of all that man saw to be his world. Jesus realized that the world was made in man's likeness. He knew that man saw his world for what it was because man was what he was. In short, man's conception of himself determines what he sees his world to be. All things are made by God, consciousness, and without him there is nothing that is made. Creation is judged good and very good because it is the perfect likeness of that consciousness which produced it. To be conscious of being a thing and then to see oneself expressing something other than that which one is conscious of being is a violation of the law of being. Therefore, it would not be good. The law of being is never violated. Man always sees himself expressing that which he is conscious of being, whether good, bad or indifferent, it is nevertheless a perfect likeness of his conception of himself. It is good and very good. Not only are all things made by God, but all things are made from God. All are the offspring of God. God is one, 
Things or divisions are projections of the one. God being one, he must order himself to be the apparent other, because there is no other. The absolute cannot contain in itself something other than itself. If it did, then it would not be absolute, the one. To be effective, commands must be addressed to oneself. I am that I am is the only effective command. I am the Lord and besides me there is none else. You cannot command that which is not. Since there is no other, you must command yourself to be what you want to appear. Let me clarify what I mean by effective order. Do not parrot the statement I am that I am. Such vain repetition would be stupid and fruitless. It is not the words that make it effective. It is the consciousness of being the thing that makes it effective. When you say, I am, you are declaring yourself to be. The word that in the statement, I am that I am, indicates that which you would be. The second I am, in the quote, is the victory cry. All this drama takes place inwardly, with or without the use of words. Be still and know that you are. This stillness is achieved by observing the observer. Repeat softly, but with feeling. I am, I am. Until you have lost all awareness of the world and know yourself simply as being. Consciousness, the knowing that you are, is God Almighty, I am. After accomplishing this, define yourself as that which you desire to be, feeling yourself to be the thing desired. I am that. This realization that you are the thing desired will cause a thrill to run through your whole being. When the conviction sets in and you truly believe that you are that which you desire to be, then the second I am is uttered as a shout of victory. This mystical revelation of Moses can be seen as three distinct steps. I am, I am free, I am indeed. No matter what the appearances around you are like, everything is prepared for the coming of the Lord. I am the Lord coming in the appearance of what I am conscious of being. All the inhabitants of the earth cannot stop my coming nor question my authority to be what I am conscious of being. I am the light of the world, crystallizing in the form of my conception of myself. Consciousness is the eternal light that crystallizes only through the medium of your conception of yourself. Change your conception of yourself and you will automatically change the world in which you live. Do not try to change people. They are only messengers telling you who you are. Revalue yourself and they will confirm the change. Now you will realize why Jesus sanctified himself instead of others why for the pure all things are pure, why in Christ Jesus, the awakened consciousness, there is no condemnation. Wake up from the sleep of condemnation and taste the principle of life. Stop not only judging others, but stop condemning yourself. Listen to the revelation of the enlightened one. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus Christ that there is nothing impure in itself, but for him who sees something impure for him it is impure. And again, Happy is the man who does not condemn himself in that which he allows. Stop asking yourself whether you are worthy or unworthy to pretend to be that which you wish to be. You will be condemned by the world only as long as you condemn yourself. You need not work at anything. The works are finished. The principle by which all things are made and without which there is nothing made that is made is eternal. You are this principle. Your consciousness of being is this eternal law. You have never expressed anything that you were not conscious of being, and you never will. Assume the consciousness of that which you wish to express. Claim it until it becomes a natural manifestation. Feel it and live within that feeling until it becomes your nature. Here is a simple formula. Withdraw your attention from your present conception of yourself and place it on that ideal of yours, the ideal which you have hitherto thought to be beyond your reach. Claim yourself as your ideal, not as something you will be in time, but as what you are in the immediate present. Do this and your present world of limitations will disintegrate as your new claim rises like the phoenix from the ashes. Fear not, nor be dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Do not fight against your problem, your problem will only live as long as you are aware of it. Turn your attention away from your problem and the multitude of reasons why you cannot reach your ideal. Concentrate all your attention on the thing desired. Drop everything and follow me. In the face of seemingly mountainous obstacles, claim your freedom. The consciousness of freedom is the father of freedom.
it has a way of expressing itself that no one knows. You will not need to fight this battle, be still, and you will see the salvation of the Lord with you. I am the Lord. I am, your consciousness, is the Lord. The consciousness that the thing is done, that the work is finished, is the Lord of any situation. Listen carefully to the promise. You will not need to fight in this battle. Stand still, and you will see the salvation of the Lord with you. With you. That particular consciousness with which you identify is the Lord of the agreement. He will single-handedly establish what is agreed on earth. Can you, in the face of the army of reasons why a thing cannot be done, calmly enter into an agreement with the Lord to get it done? Can you, now that you have found the Lord as your consciousness of being, become aware that the battle is won? Can you, no matter how close and threatening the enemy seems to be, continue in your confidence, standing still, knowing that the victory is yours? If you can, you will see the salvation of the Lord. Remember that the reward is for the one who endures. Be still. Standing still is the deep conviction that all is well. It is done. No matter what is heard or seen, you remain unmoved, conscious of being victorious in the end. All things are done by such agreements, and without such agreement there is nothing done that is done. I am that I am. In the Apocalypse it is recorded that a new heaven and a new earth will appear. John, shown this vision, was told to write, It is done. Heaven is your consciousness and earth its solidified state. Therefore, accept as John did, it is done. All that is required of you who seek change is to rise to a level of that which you desire. Without dwelling on the form of expression, register that it is done by feeling the naturalness of being done. Here is an analogy that might help you see this mystery. Suppose you walk into a movie theater just as the movie comes to an end. The only thing you saw of the movie was the happy ending. Since you wanted to see the whole story, you waited for it to unfold again. With the anticlimactic sequence, the hero appears as accused, surrounded by false evidence, and all that serves to wring tears from the audience. But you, sure you know the ending, you keep calm knowing that, regardless of the apparent direction of the film, the ending is already defined. In the same way, go to the end of what you seek. Witness the happy ending of it by consciously feeling that you express and possess what you wish to express and possess. And you, by faith, already understanding the ending, will have the confidence born of this knowledge. This knowledge will sustain you during the interval of time necessary for the picture to unfold. Do not ask man for help. Feel. It is done. Consciously affirming yourself to be now that which, as man, you hope to be. Chapter 7. Thy will be done. Not my will, but thine be done. Luke 22, 42. Not my will, but thine be done. This resignation is not that of the blind realization that I can of myself do nothing. The Father within me does the work. When man wills, he tries to make appear in time and space something that does not now exist. Too often we are not aware of what we are really doing. We unconsciously assert that we do not possess the capacities to express it. We predicate our desire on the hope of acquiring the necessary capabilities in the future. I am not, but I will be. Man does not realize that consciousness is the father who does the work, so he tries to express what he is not conscious of being. Such struggles are doomed to failure. Only the present is expressed. If I am not conscious of being what I seek, I will not find it. God, your consciousness, is the substance and fullness of everything. God's will is the recognition of what is, not what will be. The works are finished. The principle by which all things are made visible is eternal. I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the hearts of men, what God hath prepared for them that love the law. When a sculptor looks at a shapeless piece of marble, he sees, buried within its formless mass, his finished work of art. The sculptor, instead of realizing his masterpiece, merely reveals it by removing the part of the marble that hides its conception. It is the same with you. In your formless consciousness lies buried all that you could ever conceive yourself to be. The recognition of this truth will transform you from an unskilled worker who tries to make it so to a great artist who recognizes that it is so. Your affirmation that you are now that which you want to be will remove the veil of human darkness 
and perfectly reveal your affirmation. I am that. God's will was expressed in the widow's words, It is well. Man's will would have been, It shall be well. To affirm, I shall be well, is to say, I am sick. God, the eternal now, does not mock words or vain repetitions. God continually embodies what he is. Thus, the resignation of Jesus, who became equal to God, was to move from the recognition of lack, which the future indicates with, I will be, to the recognition of supply by affirming, I am that, it is done. Thank you, Father. Now you will see the wisdom in the words of the prophet when he affirms, Let the weak say, I am strong. Joel 3, 10 Man, in his blindness, does not heed the prophet's advice. He continues to assert that he is weak, poor, wretched, and all the other undesirable expressions from which he seeks to free himself, ignorantly asserting that he will be rid of these characteristics in the expectation of the future. Such thoughts frustrate the only law that can free him. There is only one door through which that which you seek can enter your world. I am the door. When you say, I am, it is being stated in the first person, in the present tense, there is no future. To know that I am is to be aware of being. Consciousness is the only door. Unless you are conscious of being that which you seek, you seek in vain. If you judge according to appearances, you will remain enslaved by the evidence of your senses. To break this hypnotic spell of the senses, you are told, enter and close the door. The door of the senses must be shut tight before your new claim can be honored. Closing the door of the senses is not as difficult as it seems at first. It is effortless. It is impossible to serve two masters at the same time. The master whom man serves is that which he is conscious of being. I am lord and master of what I am conscious of being. It is no effort for me to conjure up poverty if I am conscious of being poor. My servant, poverty, is bound to follow me, poverty conscious. As long as I am the lord conscious of being poor. Instead of fighting against the evidence of the senses, affirm that you are what you wish to be. As you turn your attention to this affirmation, the doors of the senses automatically close against your former master, that which you were conscious of being. As you lose yourself in the feeling of being, that which you now affirm to be true of yourself, the sense doors open again, revealing that your world is the perfect expression of that which you are conscious of being. Let us follow the example of Jesus, who realized that, as a man, he could do nothing to change his current image of lack. He closed the door of his senses to his problem and turned to his father, the one for whom all things are possible. Having denied the evidence of his senses, he claimed to be all that, a moment before, his senses had told him he was not. Knowing that consciousness expresses his likeness on earth, he remained in the claimed consciousness until the doors, his senses, opened and confirmed the Lord's rule. Remember, I am is Lord of all. Never again use the will of man that claims, I am. Be as resigned as Jesus and affirm, I am that. Chapter 8. There is no other God. I am the first and I am the last and beside me there is no God. Isaiah 44, 6. I am the Lord thy God, who brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Deuteronomy 5, 6 and 7. Thou shalt have no other God besides me. As long as man believes in a power apart from himself, he will deprive himself of the being that he is. Every belief in powers apart from himself, whether for good or evil, will become the mold of the image worshipped. Beliefs in the potency of medicines to cure, diets to strengthen, monies to secure, are the values or money changers that must be cast out of the power that can then unfailingly manifest that quality. This understanding casts out the temple of the money changers. Ye are the temple of the living God, a temple made without hands. It is written, My house shall be called by all nations a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. The thieves that rob you are your own false beliefs. It is your belief in a thing, not the thing itself, that helps you. There is only one power, I am He. Because of your belief in external things, you think power in them, transferring the power that you are to the external thing. 
realize that you yourself are the power you have mistakenly given to external conditions. The Bible compares the stubborn man to the camel that could not go through the eye of the needle. The eye of the needle referred to was a small gate in the walls of Jerusalem that was so narrow that a camel could not pass through it until relieved of its burden. The rich man, that is he who is burdened with false human concepts, cannot enter the kingdom of heaven until relieved of his burden, any more than the camel could pass through this little gate. Man feels so secure in his man-made laws, opinions and beliefs, that he invests them with an authority they do not possess. Satisfied that his knowledge is everything, he ignores that all outward appearances are but externalized mental states. When he realizes that the consciousness of a quality externalizes that quality without the aid of any other or many values and establishes the only true value, his own consciousness. The Lord is in his holy temple. Consciousness dwells within that which it is conscious of being. The man I am is the Lord and his temple. Knowing that conscience objectifies itself, man must forgive all men for being what they are. Peter, the enlightened or disciplined man, knew that a change of consciousness would produce a change of expression. Instead of pitying the beggars of life at the temple gate, he declared, I have neither silver nor gold for you, but what I have, the consciousness of freedom, I give you. Awaken the gift that is in you. Stop begging and claim yourself as that which you choose to be. Do this, and you too will leap from your crippled world into the world of freedom, singing praises to the Lord, I am. Far greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. This is the cry of everyone who finds that his consciousness of being is God. Your recognition of this fact will automatically cleanse the temple. Your conscience of the thieves and robbers giving you back that dominion over things which you lost the moment you forgot the commandment, Thou shalt have no other God besides me. Chapter 9. The Foundation Stone Let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And if a man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, the work of every man shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. Corinthians 1, 3, 10, and 11. The foundation of all expression is conscience. Try as man may, he can find no other cause of manifestation than his consciousness of being. Man believes he has found the cause of disease in germs, the cause of war in conflicting political ideologies and greed. All these discoveries of man, labeled as the essence of wisdom, are foolishness in the eyes of God. There is only one power, and this power is God, conscience. It kills, it makes alive, it wounds, it heals. It does all things, good, bad, or indifferent. Man moves in a world that is neither more nor less than his objectified conscience. Without knowing it, he struggles against his reflections while keeping alive the light and the images projected by the reflections. I am the light of the world. I am, consciousness, is the light. What I am conscious of being, my conception of myself, such as, I am rich, I am healthy, I am free, are the images. The world is the mirror that magnifies all that I am conscious of being. Stop trying to change the world, for it is only the mirror. Man's attempt to change the world by force is as fruitless as breaking a mirror in the hope of changing his face. Leave the mirror and change your face. Leave the world and change your conception of yourself. Then the reflection will be satisfactory. Freedom or imprisonment, satisfaction or frustration can only be differentiated by the consciousness of being. Regardless of your problem, its duration or its magnitude, careful attention to these instructions will in an amazingly short time eliminate even the memory of the problem. Ask yourself this question. How would I feel if I were free? At the very moment you sincerely ask yourself this question, the answer comes. No man can tell another the satisfaction of his fulfilled desire. It remains for each one within himself to experience the feeling and joy of this automatic change of consciousness. The feeling or emotion that comes to one in response to his self-questioning 
is the parent state of consciousness or foundation stone upon which conscious change is built. No one knows how this feeling will incarnate, but it will. The father consciousness has forms that no man knows. It is the unchanging law. All things express their nature. As you carry a feeling, it becomes your nature. It may take a moment or a year. It depends entirely upon the degree of conviction. As the doubts fade away and you can feel I am this, you begin to develop the fruit or nature of what you are feeling you are. When a person buys a new hat or a new pair of shoes, he thinks everyone knows they are new. He feels unnatural in his newly acquired clothing until it becomes a part of him. The same goes for wearing new states of consciousness. When you ask yourself the question, how would I feel if my desire were realized right now? The automatic response, until it is properly conditioned by time and use, is really disturbing. The period of adaptation to realize this potential of consciousness is comparable to the newness of putting on clothes. Not knowing that consciousness is always representing itself in the conditions around you, like Lot's wife, you continually look back at your problem and are again mesmerized by its apparent naturalness. Pay attention to the words of Jesus, salvation, leave everything and follow me, let the dead bury the dead. Your problem may have you so mesmerized by its apparent reality and naturalness that you find it difficult to clothe the new feeling or consciousness of your savior. You must assume this dressing if you want results. The stone, the consciousness, which the builders rejected, would not dress, is the cornerstone, and no other foundation can be laid by any man. Chapter 10. To him that hath. Behold then how ye hear, for unto him that hath shall be given, and from him that hath not, even that which he seemeth to have shall be taken away. Luke 8, 18. The Bible, which is the greatest psychological book ever written, warns man to be aware of what he hears. It then follows this warning with the statement, To him that hath shall be given, and from him that hath not shall be taken away. Although many consider this statement to be one of the cruelest and most unjust of the sayings attributed to Jesus, it is still a just and merciful law based on the immutable principle of the expression of life. Man's ignorance of the operation of the law does not excuse or save him from its results. The law is impersonal and therefore is no respecter of persons. Man is warned to be selective in what he hears and accepts as truth. Whatever man accepts as true leaves an impression on his conscience and in time must be defined as proof or refutation. The perceptive ear is the perfect medium through which man registers impressions. Man must discipline himself to hear only what he wants to hear, regardless of hearsay or evidence from his senses to the contrary. As he conditions his perceptive ear, he will react only to those impressions he has decided upon. This law never fails. Completely conditioned, man becomes incapable of hearing more than that, which contributes to his desire. God, as you have discovered, is that unconditioned consciousness which gives you all that you are conscious of being. To be conscious of being or having something is to be or have that which you are conscious of being. On this immutable principle, all things rest. It is impossible for anything to be other than that which is conscious of being. To him that hath that which is conscious of being shall be given. Good, bad, or indifferent, it does not matter. Man receives a hundredfold that which he is conscious of being. According to this immutable law, from him that hath not shall be taken away, and to him that hath shall be added. The rich gets richer and the poor gets poorer. You can only magnify that which you are conscious of being. All things gravitate towards that consciousness with which they are in tune. In the same way, all things disentangle themselves from that consciousness with which they are not in tune. Divide the wealth of the world equally among all men, and in a short time this equal division will be as it was originally disproportionate. The wealth will return to the pockets of those from whom it was taken. Instead of joining the chorus of the have-nots who insist on destroying the havis, recognize this immutable law of expression. Consciously define yourself as that which you desire. Once defined, having established your conscious claim, continue in this confidence until you receive the reward. As surely as day follows night any attributi, consciously claimed will manifest. Thus, 
what to the slumbering orthodox world is a cruel and unjust law, becomes to the enlightened one of the most merciful and just statements of truth. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Nothing is actually destroyed. Any apparent destruction is the result of a change in consciousness. Consciousness always completely fills the state in which it dwells. The state from which the consciousness emerges appears destructive to those unfamiliar with this law. However, this is only preparatory to a new state of consciousness. Claim yourself as that which you want to be completely filled. Nothing is destroyed, everything is fulfilled. To him that hath shall be given. Chapter 11. Christmas. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated is God with us. Matthew 1, 23. One of the most controversial statements in the New Testament concerns the virgin conception and subsequent birth of Jesus, a conception in which man had nothing to do with. It is recorded that a virgin conceived a son without the help of man, then secretly and effortlessly gave birth to his conception. This is the foundation upon which all Christianity rests. The Christian world is asked to believe this story, for man must believe the unbelievable to fully express the greatness that he is. Scientifically, man might be inclined to dismiss the whole Bible as false because his reason does not allow him to believe that the virgin birth is physiologically possible, but the Bible is a message from the soul and must be interpreted psychologically if man is to discover its true symbology. Man must see this story as a psychological drama rather than as a statement of physical fact. In doing so, he will discover that the Bible is based upon a law which, if applied to himself, will result in a manifest expression which will transcend his wildest dreams of fulfillment. To apply this law of self-expression, man must be educated in belief and disciplined to stand upon the platform that all things are possible to God. The most prominent dramatic dates of the New Testament, namely the birth, death and resurrection of Jesus, were timed and dated to coincide with certain astronomical phenomena. The mystics who recorded this history realized that at certain seasons of the year, beneficial changes on Earth coincided with astronomical changes above. In writing this psychological drama, they have personified the history of the soul as the biography of man. Using these cosmic changes, they have marked the birth and resurrection of Jesus to convey that the same beneficial changes take place psychologically in man's consciousness when he follows the law. Even for those who do not understand it, the Christmas story is one of the most beautiful ever told. When unfolded in the light of its mystical symbolism, it is revealed as the true birth of all manifestation in the world. It is known that this virgin birth took place on the 25th of December, or as celebrated by certain secret societies, on Christmas Eve, at midnight on the 24th of December. The mystics established this date to mark the birth of Jesus, because it was in consonance with the great earthly benefits signified by this astronomical change. The astronomical observations that led the authors of this drama to use, these dates were all made in the Northern Hemisphere. Therefore, from an astronomical point of view, the opposite would be true if viewed from southern latitudes. However, this history was recorded in the North and, therefore, was based on northern observations. Man discovered early on that the sun played a very important role in his life, that without the sun physical life as he knew it could not exist. So these important dates in the story of Jesus' life are based on the position of the sun as seen from the earth in northern latitudes. After the sun reaches its highest point in the heavens in June, it gradually falls southward, taking with it the life of the plant world, so that by December almost all of nature has become still. If the sun were to continue to fall southward, all nature would be stilled to death. However, on the 25th of December, the sun begins its great northward movement, bringing with it the promise of salvation and new life for the world. Each day as the sun rises in the heavens, man gains confidence in saving himself from death by cold and starvation, for he knows that as it moves northward and crosses the equator, all of nature will rise again, resurrect from its long winter sleep. Our day is measured from midnight to midnight, and, since the visible day begins in the east and ends in the west, the ancients said that the day was born of that constellation which occupied the eastern horizon at midnight. On Christmas Eve, 
or midnight of the 24th of December, the constellation Virgo Rhesus on the eastern horizon. Thus, it is recorded that this son and savior of the world was born of a Virian. It is also recorded that this virgin mother was traveling by night, that she stopped at an inn and was given the only room available among the animals and there, in a manger, where the animals were feeding, the shepherds found the holy child. The animals with which the holy virgin stayed are the holy animals of the zodiac. There, in that circle of astronomical animals in constant motion, is the holy mother, Virgo, and there you will see her every midnight of the 24th of December, standing on the eastern horizon as the sun and savior of the world begins its journey northward. Psychologically, this birth takes place in man on that day, when man discovers that his consciousness is the sun and savior of his world. When man knows the meaning of this mystical statement, I am the light of the world, he will realize that his I am, or consciousness, is the sun of his life, which radiates images upon the screen of space. These images are similar to what he, as a man, is conscious of being. Thus, the qualities and attributes that seem to move upon the screen of his world are really projections of this light from within him. The innumerable unrealized hopes and ambitions of man are the seeds that are buried within the consciousness or virgin womb of man. There they remain, as the seeds of the earth, held in the frozen wastes of winter, waiting for the sun to move northward, or for man to return to the knowledge of who he is. Upon returning, he moves northward through the recognition of his true self by affirming, I am the light of the world. When man discovers that his consciousness, or I am, is God, the savior of his world, he will be like the sun in his northward passage. All hidden impulses and ambitions will then be warmed and stimulated to birth by this knowledge of his true self. He will affirm that he is what he had hitherto hoped to be. Without the help of any man, he will define himself as that which he wishes to express. He will discover that his I am is the virgin who conceives without the help of man, that all conceptions of himself once felt and fixed in consciousness will easily incarnate as living realities in his world. Man will one day realize that all this drama takes place in his consciousness, that his unconditioned consciousness, or I am, is the Virgin Mary desiring to express herself, that through this law of self-expression, he defines himself as that which he desires to express, and that without anyone's help or cooperation, he will express that which he has consciously claimed and defined to be. He will then understand why Christmas is fixed on the 25th of December, why Easter is a movable date, why upon the virginal conception rests all Christianity, that his consciousness is the virgin womb or bride of the Lord, who receives impressions as self-impregnation, and then, unaided, embodies these impressions as the expressions of his life. Chapter 12. Crucifixion and Resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. John 11, 25. The mystery of the crucifixion and the resurrection is so intertwined that to understand it fully, both must be explained together, for one determines the other. This mystery is symbolized on earth in the rites of Good Friday and Easter. You will have observed that the anniversary of this cosmic event, announced each year by the Church, is not a fixed date as our other anniversaries marking births and deaths, but that this day changes from year to year, falling anywhere between the 22nd of March and the 25th of April. The day of the resurrection is determined in this way. Easter is celebrated on the first Sunday after the full moon in Aries. Aries begins on the 21st of March and ends approximately the 19th of April. The sun's entry into Aries marks the beginning of spring. The moon in its monthly transit around the Earth will form sometime between March 21st and April 25th in opposition to the sun, opposition which is called a full moon. The first Sunday after this phenomenon of the heavens occurs is Easter. The Friday preceding this day is observed as Good Friday. This moving date should prompt the observer to look for some interpretation other than the commonly accepted one. These days do not mark the anniversaries of the death and resurrection of an individual who lived on earth. Viewed from the earth, the sun in its northern passage appears in the spring season of the year to cross the imaginary line, which man calls the equator. Thus, 
it is said by the mystics that it was crossed or crucified so that man could live. It is significant that shortly after this event, all of nature begins to rise or resurrect from its long winter sleep. Therefore, it can be concluded that this disturbance of nature at this season of the year is directly due to this crossing. Thus, it is believed that the sun must shed its blood at Easter. If these days mark the death and resurrection of a man, they would be fixed to fall on the same date every year as all other historical events are fixed, but obviously they do not. These dates were not intended to mark the anniversaries of the death and resurrection of Jesus, the man. The scriptures are psychological dramas and will reveal their meaning only when interpreted psychologically. These dates are adjusted to coincide with the cosmic change that occurs at this time of year, marking the death of the old year and the beginning or resurrection of the new year or spring. These dates symbolize the death and resurrection of the Lord, but this Lord is not a man, it is his consciousness of being. It is recorded that he gave his life that you might live. I am have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Consciousness kills itself by shedding what it is conscious of being in order to live to what it desires to be. Spring is the time of the year when the millions of seeds, which all winter remained buried in the ground, suddenly become visible so that man may live. And because the mystical drama of the crucifixion and resurrection is in the nature of this annual change, it is celebrated at this spring season of the year, but, in reality, it is taking place at every moment of time. The crucified self is your consciousness of self, the cross is your conception of yourself, Resurrection is the raising to visibility of this conception of yourself. Far from being a day of mourning, Good Friday should be a day of rejoicing. For there can be no resurrection or expression without crucifixion or imprinting. What must be resurrected in your case is that which you wish to be. To do this, you must feel yourself to be the thing desired. You must feel, I am the resurrection and the life of desire. I am your consciousness of being, is the power that resurrects and gives life to that which in your consciousness you desire to be. Two shall agree to touch something, and I will establish it in the earth. The two who agree are you, your consciousness, the desiring consciousness, and the thing desired. When this agreement is reached, the crucifixion is complete. Two have crossed or crucified each other. I am and that, the consciousness, and that which you are conscious of being, have united and are one. I am now nailed or fixed in the belief that I am this merger. Jesus or I am is nailed to the cross of that. The nail that binds you to the cross is the nail of feeling. The mystical union is now consummated, and the result will be the birth of a child or the resurrection of a son, who bears witness to his father. Consciousness is united to that which is conscious of being. The world of expression is the child that confirms this union. The day you cease to be conscious of being what you are now conscious of being, that day your child or expression will die and return to the bosom of its father, the faceless and formless consciousness. All expressions are the result of such mystical unions. So the priests are right when they say that true marriages are made in heaven and can only be dissolved in heaven. But let me clarify this statement by telling you that heaven is not a locality, it is a state of consciousness. The kingdom of heaven is within you. In heaven, consciousness, God is touched by that which is conscious of being. Who has touched me? For I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. The moment this touching, sensing takes place, there is a descent or outflow from me into visibility. The day man feels I am free, I am rich, I am strong, God, I am, is touched or crucified by these qualities or virtues. The results of such touching or crucifixion will be seen in the birth or resurrection of the qualities felt, for man must have visible confirmation of all that he is conscious of being. Now you will know why man or the manifestation is always made in the image of God. His consciousness imagines and externalizes all that he is conscious of being. I am the Lord, and apart from me there is no God. I am the resurrection and the life. You will fixate on the belief that you are that which you desire to be. Before you have any visible proof that you are, you will know, by the deep conviction you have felt fixed within you, that you are. And so, 
without waiting for the confirmation of your senses, you will cry out, it is finished. Then, with a faith born of the knowledge of this immutable law, you will be as one dead and buried. You will be still and impassive in your conviction and confident that you will resurrect the qualities you have fixed and feel within you. Chapter 13. The Pressures of Self And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Corinthians 1, 15, 49. Your consciousness, or your I am, is the unlimited potential upon which impressions are made. I am impressions are definite states pressed upon your I am. Your consciousness, or your I am, can be likened to a sensitive film. In its virgin state, it is potentially unlimited. You can impress or record a message of love or a hymn of hate, a wonderful symphony or discordant jazz. No matter what the nature of the impression, your I am, without a murmur, will willingly receive and sustain all impressions. Your consciousness is the one referred to in Isaiah 53, 3 and 7. He was despised and rejected among men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and because we hid our faces from him, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, the castisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. As a lamb is led to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Your unconditioned consciousness is impersonal, it is no respecter of persons, without thought or effort, it automatically expresses all the impressions that are registered in it. It does not oppose any impression that is placed upon it, because, although it is capable of receiving and expressing each and every definite state, it remains always immaculate and unlimited in potential. Your I am is the basis upon which the definite state or conception of yourself rests, but it is not defined by, nor does it depend upon, such definite states for its being. Your I am neither expands nor contracts, nothing alters it or adds to it. Before any definite state existed, IT is. When all states cease to be, IT is. All definite states or conceptions of yourself are but ephemeral expressions of your eternal being. To be impressed is to be I pressed, I am pressed, first person, present tense. All expressions are the result of impressions. Only to the extent that you assert yourself as that which you wish to be will you express such desires. Let all desires become impressions of qualities that are, not qualities that will be. I am, your consciousness, is God, and God is the fullness of all, the eternal now, I am. Do not think of tomorrow. Tomorrow's expressions are determined by today's impressions. Now is the accepted time. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus, salvation, said, I am with you always. Your conscience is the Savior who is with you always. But if you deny him, he will deny you also. You deny him by affirming that he will appear, as millions today affirm that salvation is to come. This is tantamount to saying, we are not saved. You must stop looking for your Savior to appear and start affirming that you are already saved, and the signs of your affirmations will follow. When the widow was asked what she had in her house, there was recognition of substance. Her affirmation was a few drops of oil. A few drops will become a trickle if properly claimed. Your consciousness magnifies all consciousness. To affirm that I will have oil, joy, is to confess that I have empty measures. Such impressions of lack produce lack. God your conscience is no respecter of persons. Purely impersonal, God, this consciousness of all existence, receives impressions, qualities and attributes that define consciousness, i.e., your impressions. All your desires must be determined by need. Needs, apparent or real, will automatically be satisfied when they are embraced with sufficient intensity of purpose as definite desires. Knowing that your consciousness is God, you should regard every desire as the spoken word of God, which tells you what it is. Let man, whose breath is in his nostrils, for whence is he to be reckoned? We are always what our conscience defines. Never affirm, 
I will be that. Let all affirmations henceforth be, I am that I am. Before we ask, we are answered. The solution to any problem associated with desire is obvious. Every problem automatically produces the desire for a solution. Man is educated in the belief that his desires are things against which he must fight. In his ignorance, he denies his savior, who is constantly knocking at the door of consciousness to be let in. I am the door. If your wish were realized, would it not save you from your problem? Letting your savior in is the easiest thing in the world. Things must be to be let in. You are aware of a desire. The desire is something you are aware of now. Your desire, though invisible, must be affirmed by you as something that is real. God calls things that are not, unseen, as though they were. Affirming that I am the thing desired, I let the Savior in. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him, I will sup with him, and he with me. Every desire is the Savior's knock at the door. This knock every man hears. Man opens the door when he affirms, I am. Seek to let your Savior in. Let the thing desired press upon you until you are impressed with the knowledge of your Savior. Then utter the cry of victory. It is finished. Chapter 14. Circumcision. In whom also ye were circumcised by circumcision made without hands, putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Colossians 2. 11. Circumcision is the operation that removes the veil that hides the head of creation. The physical act has nothing to do with the spiritual act. Everyone could be circumcised physically and yet remain impure and blind head of the blind. The spiritually circumcised have had the veil of darkness removed and know that they are Christ, the light of the world. Let me now perform the spiritual operation on you, reader. This act is performed on the eighth day after birth, not because this day has a special significance or in any way differs from other days, but it is performed on this eighth day because eight is the number that has neither beginning nor end. Moreover, the ancients symbolized the eighth number or letter as an enclosure or veil within and behind which lay buried the mystery of creation. Thus, the secret of the operation of the eighth day is consonant with the nature of the act, which act is to reveal the eternal head of creation, that immutable something in which all things begin and end and which, nevertheless, remains its eternal being when all things cease to be. This mysterious something is your consciousness of being. At this moment, you are aware of being, but you are also aware of being someone. This someone is the veil that hides the being that you really are. First, you are conscious of being, then you are conscious of being man. After the veil of man is placed over your faceless self, you become conscious of being a member of a certain race, nation, family, creed, etc. The veil that must be lifted in spiritual circumcision is the veil of man. But first, the adhesions of race, nation, family, family, etc. must be cut off. In Christ there is neither Greek nor Jew, bond nor free, male nor female. You must leave father, mother, brother, and follow me. To achieve this, stop identifying yourself with these divisions by becoming indifferent to such statements. Indifference is the knife that cuts. Feeling is the tie that binds. When you can see man as one great brotherhood without distinction of race or creed, then you will know that you have severed these bonds. With these bonds severed, all that now separates you from your true self is your belief that you are man. To remove this last veil, abandon your conception of yourself as man by knowing yourself to simply be. Instead of the consciousness of I am man, let it be just I am, faceless, formless, and figureless. You are spiritually circumcised when the consciousness of man is dropped and your unconditioned awareness of being is revealed to you as the eternal head of creation, a formless, faceless, and omniscient presence. Then, unveiled and awakened, you will declare and know that I am is God and outside of me. This consciousness, there is no God. This mystery is symbolically told in the biblical story of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. It is narrated that Jesus stripped himself of his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After washing the feet of his disciples, he dried them with the towel with which he was girded. Peter protested about the washing of his feet, 
and was told that if he did not wash them, he would have no part in Jesus. When Peter heard this, he replied, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus answered him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean from all things. Common sense would tell the reader that a man is not clean from everything just because his feet are washed. Therefore, he should dismiss this story as fantastic or look for its hidden meaning. Every story in the Bible is a psychological drama that takes place in the consciousness of man, and this one is no exception. This washing of the disciples' feet is the mystical story of spiritual circumcision or the revelation of the Lord's secrets. Jesus is called the Lord. He is told that the name of the Lord is I Am Jesus. The story says that Jesus was naked except for a towel covering his loins or secrets. Jesus or Lord symbolizes your consciousness of being whose secrets are hidden by the towel, man's consciousness. The foot symbolizes the understanding which must be washed of all human beliefs or conceptions of self by the Lord. When the towel is removed to dry the feet, the secrets of the Lord are revealed. In short, the removal of the belief that you are man reveals your consciousness as the head of creation. Man is the foreskin that hides the head of creation. I am the Lord, hidden by the veil of man. Chapter 15. Interval of Time Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. John 14, 1 and 3. The I in whom you must believe is your consciousness, the I am, it is God. It is also the Father's house which contains within itself all conceivable states of consciousness. Each conditioned state of consciousness is called a mansion. This conversation takes place within yourself. You, I am, the unconditioned consciousness, is the Christ Jesus speaking to the conditioned self or John Smith consciousness. I am John, from a mystical point of view, is two beings, namely Christ and John. Therefore, I will prepare a place for you, moving from your present state of consciousness to that desired state. It is a promise from your Christ or being consciousness to your present conception of yourself that you will leave your present consciousness and appropriate another. Man is such a slave to time that if, after he has appropriated a state of consciousness which is now unseen by the world and it, the appropriated state, is not immediately embodied, he loses faith in his invisible claim, he immediately abandons it and returns to his former static state of being. Because of this limitation of man, I have found it very useful to employ a definite interval of time to make this journey towards a prepared mansion. Wait a little while. We have all catalogued the different days of the week, months of the year and seasons. By this I mean that you and I have said over and over again, wow, today feels like Sunday or Monday, or a Saturday. We have also said in the middle of summer, wow, this looks and feels like the fall of the year. This is proof positive that you and I have definite feelings associated with these different days, months, and seasons of the year. Because of this association, we can at any time consciously dwell in that day or season we have selected. Do not selfishly define this interval in days and hours because you are anxious to receive it, but simply abide in the conviction that it is done. Time, being purely relative, must be eliminated altogether, and your desire will be fulfilled. This ability to dwell at any point in time allows us to spend time on our journey to the desired mansion. Now I, consciousness, go to a point in time and there I prepare a place. If I go to such a point in time and prepare a place, I will return to this point in time where I have gone, and I will pick you up and take you with me to that place which I have prepared, so that where I am, there you will be also. Let me give you an example of this journey. Suppose you have an intense desire. Like most men who are enslaved by time, you might feel that it is not possible to realize such a great desire in a limited interval. But admitting that all things are possible to God, believing that God is the I within you or your being consciousness, you may say, like John, I can do nothing, but since all things are possible to God and God, I know is my being consciousness, 
I can realize my desire in a short time. How my desire will be realized I do not know, like John, but by the very law of my being, I know that it will be so. With this belief firmly established, decide what would be a relative and rational interval of time in which such a desire could be realized. Again, let me remind you not to shorten the time interval because you are anxious to receive your desire. Make it a natural interval. No one can give you the time interval. Only you can say what the natural interval would be for you. The time interval is relative, that is, no two individuals give the same measure of time for the realization of their desire. Time is always conditioned by man's conception of himself. Self-confidence, determined by conditioned consciousness, always shortens the time interval. If you were accustomed to great achievements, you would give yourself a much shorter interval to realize your desire than the man educated in defeat. If today were Wednesday, and you decided that it would be quite possible for your desire to embody a new realization of yourself by Sunday, then Sunday becomes the point in time that you would visit. To make this visit you exclude Wednesday and let Sunday in. This is accomplished by simply feeling that it is Sunday. Begin to hear the church bells, begin to feel the peacefulness of the day, and all that Sunday means to you. Really feel that it is Sunday. When you have achieved it, Feel the joy of having received what on Wednesday was nothing more than a wish. Feel the full thrill of having received it, and then go back to Wednesday, the point in time you left behind. In doing this you created a void in consciousness by moving from Wednesday to Sunday. Nature, which abhors a vacuum, rushes to fill it, thus forming a mold in the likeness of what you potentially created, i.e. E., the joy of having realized your definite desire. When you return to Wednesday, you will be filled with a joyful expectation because you have established the awareness of what must take place on the following Sunday. As you walk through the interval of Thursday, Friday and Saturday, nothing disturbs you regardless of conditions, for you predetermined what you would be on Saturday, and that remains an unalterable conviction. Having gone before and prepared the place, you have returned to John and now you take him with you through the three-day interval to the prepared place so that he may share your joy with you. For where I am there, you may be also. Chapter 16. The Triune God. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Genesis 1, 26. Having discovered that God is our consciousness of being, and that this unconditioned and immutable reality, the I Am, is the only creator, let us see why the Bible records a trinity as the creator of the world. In the 26th verse of the first chapter of Genesis, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image. The churches refer to this plurality of gods as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They have never attempted to explain what God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit means, for they are in the dark about this mystery. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three aspects or conditions of the unconditioned consciousness of being called God. The consciousness of being precedes the consciousness of being something. That unconditioned consciousness, which precedes all states of consciousness, is God I am. The three conditioned aspects or divisions of self can best be counted in this way. The receptive attitude of mind is the aspect that receives impressions and, therefore, can be likened to the womb or mother. That which makes the impression is the masculine or pressing aspect and is therefore known as the father. In time, the impression becomes expression, and this expression is always the likeness and image of the impression. Therefore, this objectified aspect is said to be the son bearing witness to his father-mother. The comprehension of this mystery of the Trinity allows the one who understands it to completely transform his world and model it to his liking. Here is a practical application of this mystery. Sit in silence and decide what you would most like to express or possess. After deciding, close your eyes and turn your attention completely away from anything that might impede the realization of what you desire. Then adopt a receptive mental attitude and play guessing games by imagining how you would feel if you could now realize your desire. Begin to listen as if space is speaking to you and telling you that you are now what you wish to be. This receptive attitude is the state of consciousness you must assume before an impression can be made. Once you have reached this ductile and impressive state of mind, 
begin to impress yourself with the fact that you are what you wish to be, affirming and feeling that you are now expressing and possessing what you had decided to be and have. Continue in this attitude until the impression is made. As you contemplate that you are and possess what you have decided to be and have, you will notice that with each inhalation of breath, a joyous emotion runs through your entire being. This emotion increases in intensity as you feel more and more the joy of being what you are claiming to be. Then, on a final deep inhalation, your whole being will explode with the joy of accomplishment and you will know by your feeling that you are imbued by God the Father. As soon as the impression is made, open your eyes and return to the world that a few moments before you had closed. In this receptive attitude of yours, as you contemplated being what you wished to be, you actually performed the spiritual act of generation. Thus you are now, on returning from this silent meditation, a pregnant being carrying a child or impression which was immaculately conceived without the help of man. Doubt is the only force capable of disturbing the seed or impression to avoid the abortion of such a wonderful child, walk in secret during the necessary interval of time it will take for the impression to become expression. Tell no one of your spiritual romance. Lock up your secret within you with joy, confident and happy, that one day you will give birth to your lover's child, expressing and possessing the nature of your impression. Then you will know the mystery of God said, Let us make man in our image. You will know that the plurality of gods to which you refer are the three aspects of your own consciousness, and that you are the Trinity, gathered in spiritual conclave to fashion a world in the image and likeness of that which you are conscious of being. Chapter 17. Prayer. When thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Matthew 6, 6. Whatsoever things ye shall ask when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. Mark 11, 24. Prayer is the most wonderful experience man can have. Unlike the daily murmurings of the vast majority of mankind in all lands, who by their vain repetitions hope to gain the ear of God, prayer is the ecstasy of a spiritual wedding which takes place in the deep and silent stillness of consciousness. In its true sense, prayer is God's wedding ceremony. Just as a maiden on her wedding day renounces the name of her family to assume the name of her husband, so the one who prays must renounce his present name or nature and assume the nature of that for which he prays. The Gospels have clearly instructed man as to the performance of this ceremony as follows. When you pray, enter in secretly and shut the door, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you in public. The entrance is the entrance into the bridal chamber, just as no one but the bride and groom are allowed to enter a room as sacred as the bridal suite on the night of the marriage ceremony, so no one but the one who prays, and that for which he prays, is allowed to enter the sacred hour of prayer. Just as the bride and groom on entering the bridal suite close the door against the outside world, so he who enters the holy hour of prayer must close the door of the senses and completely shut out the world around him. This is achieved by turning one's attention completely away from all things other than that which one is now in love with, the thing desired. The second phase of this spiritual ceremony is defined in these words, when you pray, believe that you will receive and you will receive. By joyfully contemplating being and possessing that which you desire to be and to have, you have taken this second step and therefore are spiritually performing the acts of marriage and generation. Your receptive mental attitude while praying or contemplating can be likened to that of a bride or a womb, for it is that aspect of the mind that receives the impressions. That which you contemplate being is the bridegroom, for it is the name or nature that you assume, and therefore it is that which leaves its impregnation. Thus one dies to the present maidenhood, or nature by assuming the name and nature of the impregnation. Lost in contemplation and having assumed the name and nature of the contemplated, your whole being shudders with the joy of being. This shuddering that runs through your whole being as you appropriate the consciousness of your desire is the proof that you are married and impregnated. When you return from this silent meditation, the door opens again to the world you had left behind. But this time, you return as a pregnant bride. You enter the world as a changed being and, 
although no one but you knows of this wonderful romance, the world will soon see the signs of your pregnancy, for you will begin to express that which in your hour of silence you felt you were. The mother of the world or bride of the Lord is purposely called Mary, or water, for water loses its identity by assuming the nature of that with which it mingles. In the same way, Mary, the receptive attitude of mind, must lose its identity by assuming the nature of the thing desired, only to the extent that one is willing to give up one's present limitations and identity can one become that which one desires to be. Prayer is the formula by which such divorces and marriages are achieved. Two shall agree concerning anything, and it shall be established on earth. The two who agree are you, the bride, and the thing desired, the bridegroom. When this agreement is fulfilled, a child will be born who will bear witness to this union. You begin to express and possess that which you are conscious of being. To pray, then, is to recognize yourself as that which you desire to be, instead of begging God for that which you desire. Millions of prayers go unanswered daily because man prays to a God who does not exist. Consciousness being God, one must seek in consciousness the thing desired by assuming the consciousness of the desired quality. Only then will his prayers be answered. To be conscious of being poor while praying for riches is to be rewarded with that which one is conscious of being, i.e., poverty. For prayers to be successful, they must be claimed and appropriated. Assume positive awareness of the thing desired. Once you have defined your desire, go quietly within and close the door behind you. Lose yourself in your desire. Feel that you are one with it. Remain in this fixation until you have absorbed the life and the name by claiming and feeling that you are and have that which you desired. When you come out of the hour of prayer, you must do so conscious of being and possessing that which you once desired. Chapter 18. The Twelve Disciples And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits, to cast them out, and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Matthew 10. 1. The twelve disciples represent the twelve qualities of mind that can be controlled and disciplined by man. If they are disciplined, they will obey at all times the command of the one who has disciplined them. These twelve qualities in man are potentials of every mind. Without discipline, their actions are more like those of a mob than those of a trained and disciplined army. All the storms and confusions that engulf man can be traced directly to these twelve ill-related characteristics of the human mind in its present state of lethargy. Until they are awakened and disciplined, they will allow every sensual rumor and emotion to move them. When these twelve are disciplined and brought under control, the one who achieves this control will say to them, Henceforth I will not call you slaves, but friends. He knows that, from that moment on, every disciplined attribute of mind that he has acquired will become his friend and protect him. The names of the twelve qualities reveal their nature. These names are not given to you until you are called to discipleship. They are Simon, later surnamed Peter, Andrew, James, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, James son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas. The first quality to be called and disciplined is Simon, or the attribute of hearing. This faculty when raised to the level of a disciple, allows only those impressions to reach the consciousness which his ear has commanded him to let in. No matter what the wisdom of man may suggest, or the evidence of his senses convey, if such suggestions and ideas do not agree with what he hears, he remains unmoved. This one has been instructed by his Lord, and made to understand that every suggestion which he allows to pass through his door, when it reaches his Lord and Master, his conscience, will leave its impression there, an impression which in time must become expression. The instruction to Simon is that he should only allow worthy and honourable visitors, or impressions, to enter the house, conscience of his Lord. No error can be covered up or hidden from his master, for every expression of life tells his Lord whom he consciously or unconsciously entertained. When Simon by his works proves himself to be a true and faithful disciple, then he receives the surname of Peter, or the Rock, the unmoved disciple, the one who cannot be bribed or coerced by any visitor. He is called by his lord Simon Peter, 
the one who listens faithfully to the commands of his Lord, and moreover what commands he does not listen to. It is this Simon Peter who discovers that the I Am is Christ, and for his discovery he is given the keys of heaven and is made the foundation stone upon which the temple of God rests. Buildings must have firm foundations, and only the disciplined ear can, upon learning that the I Am is Christ, stand firm and unmoved in the knowledge that I am Christ, and apart from me there is no Saviour. The second quality to be called to discipleship is Andrew or courage. As the first quality, faith in oneself, is developed, its sibling, courage, automatically emerges. Faith in oneself, which asks no one for help, but quietly and solitarily appropriates the consciousness of the desired quality, and, in spite of reason or the evidence of its senses to the contrary, continues faithful, waiting patiently in the knowledge that its invisible claim, if maintained, must be realized. Such faith develops a courage and strength of character that are beyond the wildest dreams of the undisciplined man whose faith is in things seen. The faith of the undisciplined man cannot really be called faith, for if the armies, the medicines or the wisdom of the man in which his faith is placed are taken from him, his faith and his courage go with them. But to the disciplined man, the whole world could be taken from him and yet he would remain faithful knowing that the state of consciousness in which he dwells must incarnate itself in due time. This courage is Peter's brother, Andrew, the disciple, who knows what it is to dare to do and to keep silent. The next two calls are also related. They are the brothers James and John, James the Righteous, the Just Judger, and his brother John, the Beloved. Justice to be wise must be administered with love, always turning the other cheek and returning at all times good for evil, love for hate, not violence for violence. The disciple James, symbol of disciplined judgment, when elevated to the high office of supreme judge, must be blindfolded, so as not to be influenced by the flesh nor judge according to the appearances of self. Disciplined judgment is administered by one who is not influenced by appearances. The one who has called these brethren to discipleship remains faithful to his command to hear only that which he has been commanded to hear, that is, the good. The man who has disciplined this quality of his mind is incapable of hearing and accepting as true anything from himself or another, that in hearing it does not fill his heart with love. These two disciples or aspects of the mind are one and inseparable when awakened. Such a disciplined person forgives all men for being what they are. He knows as a wise judge that every man expresses perfectly what he is as a man conscious of being. He knows that on the immutable foundation of consciousness rests all manifestation, that changes of expression can only come about through changes of consciousness. Without condemnation or criticism, these disciplined qualities of mind allow each one to be what he is. However, while allowing this perfect freedom of choice to all, they are ever vigilant to see that they themselves prophesy and do, both for others and for themselves, only those things which when expressed glorify, dignify, and give joy to the one who expresses them. The fifth quality called to discipleship is Philip. He asked to be shown the Father. The awakened man knows that the Father is the state of consciousness in which man dwells, and that this state or Father can only be seen when he expresses himself. He knows that he himself is the perfect likeness or image of that consciousness with which he identifies himself. Thus, he declares, no one has ever seen my Father, but I, the Son, who dwells in his bosom, have revealed him. Therefore, when you see me, the Son, you will see my Father, for I come to bear witness to my Father. I and my Father, consciousness and its expression, God and man, we are one. This aspect of mind, when disciplined, persists until ideas, ambitions and desires become embodied realities. It is the quality that affirms, but in my flesh, I shall see God. He knows how to make the word flesh, how to give form to the formless. The sixth disciple is called Bartholomew. This quality is the imaginative faculty, a quality of the mind that, once awakened, distinguishes one from the masses. An awakened imagination places the awakened person above the common man, giving him the appearance of a beacon light in a world of darkness. No quality so separates man from man as the disciplined imagination. 
it is the separation of the wheat from the chaff. Those who have contributed the most to society are our artists, scientists, inventors and other people with a vivid imagination. If a survey were done to determine the reason why so many seemingly educated men and women fail in their postgraduate years, or if it were done to determine the reason for the different incomes of the masses, there would be no doubt that imagination plays a major role. Such a study would show that it is imagination that makes a person a leader, while lack of imagination makes him a follower. Instead of developing man's imagination, our educational system often stifles it by trying to introduce into man's mind the wisdom he seeks. It forces him to memorize a series of textbooks which, all too soon, are refuted by later textbooks. Education is not accomplished by putting something into man. Its purpose is to draw out of him the wisdom that is latent within him. Let the reader call Bartholomew to discipleship, for only as this quality rises to discipleship will he have the capacity to conceive ideas that lift him beyond the limitations of man. The seventh is called Thomas. This disciplined quality doubts or denies all rumors and suggestions that are not in harmony with what Simon Peter has been commanded to let in. The man who is conscious of being healthy, not because of inherited health, diets or climate, but because he is awake and knows the state of consciousness in which he lives, will continue, despite the conditions of the world, to express health. He could hear through the press, the radio and the wise men of the world that a plague was ravaging the earth, and yet he would remain unmoved and unimpressed. Thomas, the skeptic, when disciplined, denied that disease or anything else that was not sympathetic to the consciousness to which he belonged had any power to affect him. This quality of denial, when disciplined, protects man from receiving impressions that are not in harmony with his nature. He adopts an attitude of total indifference to all suggestions that are foreign to what he wishes to express. Disciplined denial is not a struggle or a fight, but a total indifference. The octave is a gift from God. This quality of mind reveals man's desires as gifts from God. The man who has called this disciple into existence knows that every desire of his heart is a gift from heaven and that it contains both the power and the plan of his self-expression. Such a man never questions the manner of his expression. He knows that the plan of expression is never revealed to man, for the ways of God cannot be discovered. He fully accepts his desires as gifts already received and goes on his way in peace trusting that they will appear. The ninth disciple is called James, son of Alphaeus. This is the quality of discernment. A clear and orderly mind is the voice that calls this disciple. This faculty perceives what is not revealed to the eye of man. This disciple does not judge from appearances, for he has the ability to function in the realm of causes and therefore is never deceived by appearances. Clairvoyance is the faculty that is awakened when this quality is developed and disciplined, not the clairvoyance of the mediumship rooms, but the true clairvoyance or clear vision of the mystic. That is to say, this aspect of the mind has the capacity to interpret what is seen, Discernment or the ability to diagnose is the quality of James, son of Alpheus. Thaddeus X is the disciple of praise, a quality which undisciplined man is sadly lacking. When this quality of praise and thanksgiving is awakened in man, he walks with the words, Thank you, Father, always on his lips. He knows that his thankfulness for things unseen opens the windows of heaven and allows gifts beyond his capacity to receive to be showered upon him. The man who is not thankful for things received is not likely to be the recipient of many gifts from the same source. Until this quality of mind is disciplined, man will not see the desert bloom like the rose. Praise and thanksgiving are to the invisible gifts of God, one's desires, what rain and sunshine are to the invisible seeds in the bosom of the earth. The eleventh quality called is Simon of Canaan. A good key phrase for this disciple is hearing good news. Simon of Canaan, or Simon of the land of milk and honey, when called to discipleship, is proof that the caller to this faculty has become aware of the abundant life. He can say with the psalmist David, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. This disciplined aspect of the mind is incapable of hearing anything but good news, 
so it is well qualified to preach the gospel or the good spell. The twelfth and last of the disciplined qualities of mind is called Judas. When this quality is awakened, man knows that he must die to what he is before he can become what he wishes to be. That is why it is said of this disciple that he committed suicide, which is the mystic's way of telling the initiate that Judas is the disciplined aspect of detachment. He knows that his I am or consciousness is his savior, so he lets go of all other saviors. This quality, when disciplined, gives one the strength to let go. The man who has called Judas into existence has learned to turn his attention away from problems or limitations and place it on that which is the solution or savior. Except ye be born again, ye cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for a friend. When man realizes that the desired quality, if realized, would save him and make him a friend, he willingly surrenders his life, present conception of himself, for his friend detaching his consciousness from that which he is conscious of being and assuming the consciousness of that which he desires to be. Judas, the one whom the world in its ignorance has blackened, when man awakens from his undisciplined state will be placed on high because God is love, and no greater love has man than to lay down his life for a friend. Until man detaches himself from what he is now conscious of being, he will not become what he desires to be. And Judas is the one who achieves this by suicide or detachment. These are the twelve qualities that were given to man at the foundation of the world. Man's duty is to raise them to the level of discipleship. When this is accomplished, man will say, I have finished the work you gave me to do. I have glorified thee on earth. And now, O Father, glorify me beside thee with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Chapter 19. Liquid Light. In him we live, move, and exist. Acts 17, 28. Psychically, this world appears as an ocean of light containing within itself all things, including man, as pulsating bodies enveloped in liquid light. The biblical story of the flood is the state in which man lives. Man is actually a wash in an ocean of liquid light in which innumerable beings of light move. The story of the flood is actually being enacted today. Man is the ark, which contains within itself the masculine-feminine principles of every living being. The dove or idea that is sent to seek dry land is man's attempt to embody his ideas. Man's ideas are like the birds in flight, like the dove in the story, which return to man without finding a place to rest. If man does not let these fruitless searches discourage him, one day the bird will return with a green twig. After assuming the consciousness of the thing desired, he will be convinced that it is so, and he will feel and know that he is that which he has consciously appropriated, even if it is not yet confirmed by his senses. One day the man will so identify himself with his conception that he will know that he is himself and will declare, I am, I am what I wish to be, I am that I am. He will discover that, in so doing, he will begin to incarnate his desire, the dove or desire will this time find solid ground, thus realizing the mystery of the word made flesh. Everything in the world is a crystallization of this liquid light. I am the light of the world. Your consciousness of being is the liquid light of the world that crystallizes in the conceptions you have of yourself. Your unconditioned consciousness of being first conceived of itself in liquid light, which is the initial velocity of the universe, all things, from the highest to the lowest vibrations or expressions of life, are but the different vibrations or velocities of this initial velocity, gold, silver, iron, wood, flesh, etc., are nothing but different expressions or velocities of this one substance, liquid light. All things are crystallized liquid light. The differentiation or infinity of expression is caused by the desire of the conceiver to know himself. The conception you have of yourself automatically determines the speed necessary to express what you have conceived yourself to be. The world is an ocean of liquid light in countless different states of crystallization. Chapter 20. The Breath of Life. Did the prophet Elijah really bring the widow's dead son back to life? This story, along with all the other stories in the Bible, is a psychological drama unfolding in man's consciousness. 
The widow symbolizes all the men and women of the world. The dead child represents man's frustrated desires and ambitions, while the prophet, Elijah, symbolizes the power of God within man or man's consciousness of being. The story tells us that the prophet took the dead child from the widow's breast and carried him to an upper room. Entering this upper room, he closed the door behind them, placing the child on a bed. He breathed life into it, returning to the mother. He handed the child to her and said, Woman, your son lives. Man's desires can be symbolized as the dead child. The mere fact that he desires is proof positive that the thing desired is not yet a living reality in his world. He tries by every conceivable means to make this desire a reality, to make it live, but in the end, he discovers that all attempts are fruitless. Most men are not aware of the existence of the infinite power within themselves like the prophet. They remain indefinitely with a dead child in their arms, not realizing that desire is the positive indication of unlimited capabilities for its realization. Let man once recognize that his consciousness is a prophet breathing life into all that he is conscious of being, and he will shut the door of his senses against his problem and fix his attention solely upon that which he desires, knowing that in so doing, his desires will surely be realized. He will discover that recognition is the breath of life, for he will perceive, by consciously affirming, that he now expresses or possesses all that he desires to be or to have, that he will be breathing the breath of life into his desire. The quality claimed for desire, in a way unknown to him, will begin to move and become a living reality in his world. Yes, the prophet Elijah lives forever as man's unlimited consciousness of being, the widow as his limited consciousness of being, and the child as that which he desires to be. Chapter 21. Daniel in the Lion's Den. Thy God, whom thou servest continually, will deliver thee. Daniel. 6. 16. The story of Daniel is the story of every man. It is recorded that Daniel, while shut up in the lion's den, turned his back upon the ravenous beasts, and with his vision turned towards the light streaming from on high, he prayed to the one God. The lions, purposely starved to death for the feast, remained powerless to hurt the prophet. Daniel's faith in God was so great that he finally got his freedom and his appointment to a high position in the government of his country. This story was written for you, to instruct you in the art of freeing yourself from any trouble or imprisonment in the world. Most of us, finding ourselves in the lion's den, would worry only about the lions. We would not think of any other problem in the world other than the lions. However, we are told that Daniel turned his back on them and looked towards the light which was God. If we could follow Daniel's example while we are threatened by any dire disaster, such as lions, poverty, or disease, if, like Daniel, we could turn our attention to the light that is God, our solutions would be equally simple. For example, if you were imprisoned, no man would need to tell you that what you should desire is freedom. Freedom, or rather the desire to be free, would be automatic. The same would be true if you were ill in debt or in any other predicament, Lions represent seemingly insoluble situations of a threatening nature. Every problem automatically produces its solution in the form of a desire to be free of the problem. Therefore, turn your back on your problem and focus your attention on the desired solution, feeling already like that which you desire. Continue with this belief, and you will find that your prison wall will disappear as you begin to express what you have become conscious of being. I have seen people seemingly hopelessly in debt apply this principle, and in a very short time, debts that were enormous disappeared. I have also seen those whom the doctors had given up as incurable apply this principle, and in an incredibly short time, their supposedly incurable disease vanished and left no scars. See your desires as the spoken words of God and every word of prophecy of what you are capable of being. Do not question whether you are worthy or unworthy to fulfill these desires. Accept them as they come to you. Be grateful for them as if they were gifts. Feel happy and grateful for having received such wonderful gifts. Then go on your way in peace. This simple acceptance of your desires is like dropping a fertile seed into ever-ready soil. When you drop your desire into consciousness as a seed, trusting that it will appear in its full potential, 
you have done all that is expected of you. To worry or fret about the manner of its unfolding is to mentally withhold these fertile seeds and therefore prevent them from actually ripening to their full harvest. Do not worry about the results. The results will come as surely as day follows night. Have faith in this sowing until the evidence manifests itself to you. Your confidence in this procedure will give you great rewards. You wait only a little while in the consciousness of the thing desired. Then, suddenly, and when you least expect it, the thing felt becomes your expression. Life is no respecter of persons and destroys nothing. It continues to keep alive what man is conscious of being. Things will disappear only when man changes his consciousness. Deny it if you will, it remains a fact that consciousness is the only reality and things are but the mirror of what you are conscious of being. The heavenly state you seek will only be found in consciousness, for the kingdom of heaven is within you. Your consciousness is the only living reality, the eternal head of creation. What you are conscious of being is the temporary body you wear. To turn your attention away from that which you are conscious of being is to decapitate that body. But just as a chicken or a snake continues to jump and throb for a time after its head has been removed, so qualities and conditions seem to live for a time after your attention has been turned away from them. Man being ignorant of this law of consciousness constantly circles back to his former habitual conditions and by being attentive to them, places upon these dead bodies the eternal head of creation, thus reviving and resuscitating them. He must leave these dead bodies alone and let the dead bury the dead. Man, after having put his hand to the plough, i.e., after having assumed the consciousness of the desired quality, by looking back can only defeat his fitness for the kingdom of heaven. As the will of heaven is always done on earth, you are today in the heaven you have established within you, for here, on this very earth, your heaven is revealed. The kingdom of heaven is truly at hand. Now is the accepted time. Thus create a new heaven, enter into a new state of consciousness, and a new earth will appear. Chapter 22. Fishing. They went out and entered into a boat, and that night they caught nothing. John 21. 3. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and ye shall find. So they cast the net, and could not draw it for the multitude of fish. John 21, 6. It is recorded that the disciples fished all night and caught nothing. Then Jesus appeared on the scene and told them to cast their nets again, but this time to cast them on the right side. Peter obeyed Jesus' voice and let down the nets again into the water, where a moment before the water was completely empty of fish, the nets almost broke with the number of the resulting catch. Man, fishing throughout the night of human ignorance, tries to realize his desires through effort and struggle, only to discover in the end that his quest is fruitless. When man discovers that his consciousness of being is Christ Jesus, he will obey his voice and let it direct his fishing. He will cast his hook on the right side, he will apply the law in the right way and search his conscience for the desired thing. When he finds it, he will know that it will multiply in the world of form. Those who have had the pleasure of fishing know how exciting it is to feel the fish on the hook. The bite of the fish is followed by the game of the fish. This game, in turn, is followed by the landing of the fish. Something similar happens in man's consciousness when he fishes for the manifestations of life. Fishermen know that if they want to catch big fish, they must fish in deep water. If they want to catch a large measure of life, they must leave behind the shallow waters with their numerous reefs and barriers and cast out into the deep blue waters where the big ones play. To fish for the great manifestations of life, you must enter deeper and freer states of consciousness. Only in these depths do the great expressions of life live. Here is a simple formula for successful fishing. First decide what it is that you want to express or possess. This is essential. You must know definitively what you want out of life before you can fish for it. Once you have made your decision, detach yourself from the world of the senses, withdraw your attention from the problem, and place it on simply being by repeating softly but with feeling, I am. As you withdraw your attention from the world around you and place it on the I am, so that you lose yourself in the feeling of simply being, you will find yourself letting go of the anchor that bound you to the shallow waters of your problem. And effortlessly, 
you will find yourself moving into the depths. The sensation that accompanies this act is one of expansion. You will feel yourself rising and expanding as if you are actually growing. Do not be afraid of this experience of floating and growing, for you will not die to anything but your limitations. However, your limitations will die as you move away from them, as they only live in your consciousness. In this deep or expanded consciousness, you will feel yourself as a powerful pulsating power, as deep and as rhythmic as the ocean. This expanded feeling is the sign that you are now in the deep blue waters where the big fish swim. Suppose the fish you have decided to fish for are health and freedom. You begin to fish in this formless pulsating depth of yourself for these qualities or states of consciousness, feeling, I am healthy, I am free. Continue to affirm and feel that you are healthy and free until the conviction that you are so possesses you. As the conviction is born within you, so that all doubts disappear, and you know and feel that you are free from the limitations of the past, you will know that you have hooked these fish. The joy that runs through your whole being as you feel that you are what you wish it to be is equal to the excitement of the fisherman when he hooks his fish. Now comes the game of fish. This is achieved by returning to the world of the senses. When you open your eyes to the world around you, the conviction and awareness that you are healthy and free must become so established in you that your whole being quivers with anticipation. Then, as you travel the necessary interval of time that it will take for the felt things to incarnate, you will feel a secret thrill in the knowledge that before long that which no man sees will land, but that which you feel and know yourself to be. In a moment when you do not think, as you walk faithfully in this consciousness, you will begin to express and possess that which you are conscious of being and possessing, experiencing with the fisherman the joy of landing the Great One. Now, go and fish the manifestations of life by casting your nets on the right side. Chapter 23. Be Hearing Ears. Let these words enter into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. Luke 9, 44. Let these words enter into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. Do not be like those who have eyes that do not see and ears that do not hear. Let these revelations sink deep into your ears, for after the sun, the idea, is conceived, man with his false values, reason, will try to explain the why and wherefore of the sun's expression, and in doing so will tear it to pieces. After men have agreed that a certain thing is humanly impossible and therefore cannot be done, let someone else do the impossible thing. The wise men who said it could not be done will begin to tell you why and how it happened. When they have finished tearing the seamless cloak, cause of manifestation, they will be as far from the truth as they were when they proclaimed it impossible. As long as man looks for the cause of expression in places other than the expressor, he will search in vain. For thousands of years man has been told, I am the resurrection and the life. No manifestation comes to me without my attracting it, but man does not believe it, he prefers to believe in causes outside himself. The moment the unseen becomes visible, man is ready to explain the cause and purpose of its appearance. Thus the Son of Man, idea desirous of manifestation, is constantly destroyed at the hands, reasonable explanation or wisdom, of man. Now that your consciousness is revealed to you as the cause of all expression, do not return to the darkness of Egypt with its many gods. There is only one God, the only God is your conscience, and all the inhabitants of the earth are considered as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven, and among the inhabitants of the earth and no one can stay his hand, nor say to him, What do you do? If everyone agreed that a certain thing could not be expressed, and yet you became conscious of being that which they had agreed could not be expressed, you would express it. Your consciousness never asks permission to express what you are conscious of being. It does so, naturally and effortlessly, in spite of man's wisdom and all opposition. Greet no one, by the way. It is not a command to be insolent or unfriendly, but a reminder not to recognize a superior, not to see in anyone, a barrier to your expression. No one can stay your hand or question your ability to express what you are conscious of being. Do not judge according to the appearance of a thing, for all things are as nothing in the sight of God. 
When the disciples, by their judgment of appearances, saw the mad child, they thought it was a more difficult problem to solve than others they had seen, and so they failed to achieve healing. By judging according to appearances, they forgot that for God, everything is possible. Hypnotized as they were by the reality of appearances, they could not feel the naturalness of sanity. The only way for you to avoid such failures is to constantly keep in mind that your consciousness is the Almighty, that all-wise presence, unaided. This unknown presence within you effortlessly externalizes that which you are conscious of being. Be perfectly indifferent to the evidence of the senses so that you may feel the naturalness of your desire and your desire will be realized. Turn away from appearances and feel the naturalness of that perfect perception within you, a quality never to be distrusted or doubted. Its understanding will never lead you astray. Your desire is the solution to your problem. As the desire is realized, the problem dissolves. You cannot force anything outwardly with the most powerful effort of the will. There is only one way to order the things you desire, and that is to assume the consciousness of the things desired. There is a great difference between feeling a thing and merely knowing it intellectually. You must unreservedly accept the fact that by possessing, feeling, a thing in consciousness, you have ordered the reality that causes it to come into existence in a concrete form. You must be absolutely convinced that there is an unbreakable connection between the invisible reality and its visible manifestation. Your inner acceptance must become an intense and unalterable conviction that transcends both reason and intellect, completely renouncing any belief in the reality of externalization except as a reflection of an inner state of consciousness. When you truly understand and believe these things, you will have built a certainty so profound that nothing can shake you. Your desires are the invisible realities that respond only to the commands of God. God commands the invisible to appear by claiming to be himself the thing commanded. He made himself equal to God, and it seemed not robbery to him to do the works of God. Now let this saying sink deep into your ear. Be aware of being that which you want to appear. Chapter 24. Clairvoyance, the Count of Monte Cristo. Having eyes do you not see, and having ears do you not hear, and do you not remember. Mark 8, 18. True clairvoyance is not based on the ability to see things beyond the range of human vision, but on the ability to understand what is seen. A financial statement can be seen by anyone, but very few can read a financial statement. The ability to interpret the financial statement is the mark of clear vision or clairvoyance. That every object, both animate and inanimate, is enveloped in a liquid light that moves and pulsates with an energy far more radiant than the objects themselves. No one knows better than the author. But he also knows that the ability to see such auras does not equate to the ability to understand what one sees in the world around him. To illustrate this point, here is a story with which the whole world is familiar, yet only the true mystic or clairvoyant has ever actually seen it. Synopsis. The story of Dumas' Count of Monte Cristo is, for the mystic and the true clairvoyant, the biography of every man. First, Edmond Dante, a young sailor, finds the captain of his ship dead. Taking command of the ship in the middle of a storm-tossed sea, he tries to steer it to a safe anchorage. Second, Dante has a secret document that he must deliver to a man he does not know, but which will be made known to the young sailor in due course. This document is a plan to free Emperor Napoleon from his prison on the island of Elba. Third, when Dante's arrives in port, three men, who by their flattery and praise have managed to win the sympathy of the present king, Fearful of any change that might alter their positions in the government, have the young sailor arrested and interned in the catacombs. Fourth, in this tomb, Dante is forgotten and abandoned to his fate. Many years pass. One day, Dante, who is already a living skeleton, hears a knock at his door. As he answers, he hears the voice of someone on the other side of the stone. In response to this voice, Dante removes the stone and discovers an old priest who has been in prison for so long that no one knows the reason for his imprisonment or how long he has been there. Fifth, the old priest had spent many years digging his way out of this living tomb only to discover that he had dug his way into Dante's tomb. He then resigns himself to his fate and decides to find his joy and freedom 
by instructing Dantes in all he knows about the mysteries of life and also helping him to escape. Dantes, at first, is impatient to acquire all this information, but the old priest, with infinite patience harvested through his long imprisonment, shows Dantes how incapable he is of receiving this knowledge in his present, unprepared and anxious mind. Thus, with philosophical calm, he slowly reveals to the young man the mysteries of life and time. Sixth, as Dante matures under the instructions of the old priest, the old man finds himself living more and more in the consciousness of Dante. Finally, he imparts to Dante his last bit of wisdom, making him competent to hold positions of trust. Next, he tells him of an inexhaustible treasure buried on the island of Monte Cristo. Seventh, before this revelation, the walls of the catacomb that separated them from the ocean collapse, crushing the old man to death. The guards, upon discovering the accident, sew the body of the old priest in a sack and prepare to throw him into the sea. As they leave for a stretcher, Dante removes the body of the old priest and sews himself into the sack. The guards, unaware of this change of bodies, and believing it to be the old man, throw Dante's into the water. Eighth, Dante's frees himself from the sack, goes to the island of Monte Cristo, and discovers the buried treasure. Then, armed with this fabulous wealth and this superhuman wisdom, he discards his human identity of Edmond Dante and assumes the title of Count of Monte Cristo. Comment. First, Life itself is a storm-tossed sea with which man struggles as he tries to make his way to a harbour of rest. Second, within each man is the secret plan that will unleash the mighty emperor within. Third, man, in his attempt to find security in this world, allows himself to be deceived by the false lights of greed, vanity and power. Most men believe that fame, great wealth or political power will protect them against the storms of life so they seek to acquire them as anchors of their life, only to find that in their pursuit of these, they gradually lose the knowledge of their true selves. If man puts his faith in things that are not himself, that in which he puts his faith will eventually destroy him. At that time he will be as one imprisoned in confusion and despair. Fourth, here, behind these walls of mental darkness, man remains in what seems to be a living death. After years of deception, man turns away from these false friends and discovers in himself the old one, his consciousness of being, that has been buried since the day he first believed himself to be man and forgot that he was God. Fifth, the old priest had spent many years digging his way out of this living tomb, only to discover that he had dug his way into Dante's tomb. He then resigns himself to his fate and decides to find his joy and freedom by instructing Dante's in all he knows about the mysteries of life and also helping him to escape. Dante's, at first, is impatient to acquire all this information, but the old priest, with infinite patience harvested through his long imprisonment, shows Dante's how incapable he is of receiving this knowledge in his present, unprepared and anxious mind. Thus, with philosophical calm, he slowly reveals to the young man the mysteries of life and time. This revelation is so wonderful that when the man first hears it, he wants to acquire it at once. But he discovers that, after countless years spent in the belief of being a man, he has so completely forgotten his true identity that he is now incapable of absorbing this memory at once. He also discovers that he can only do so to the extent that he detaches himself from all human values and opinions. Sixth, as Dante matures under the instructions of the old priest, the old priest finds himself living more and more in Dante's consciousness. Finally, he imparts his last bit of wisdom to Dante, making him competent to hold positions of trust. He then tells him of an inexhaustible treasure buried on the island of Monte Cristo. As man abandons these precious human values, he absorbs more and more of the light, the old priest, until finally he becomes the light and knows himself to be the Ancient One. I am the light of the world. Seventh, at this revelation, the walls of the catacomb that separated them from the upper ocean collapse, crushing the old man to death. The guards, upon discovering the accident, sew the body of the old priest in a sack 
and prepare to throw him into the sea. As they leave for a stretcher, Dante removes the body of the old priest and sews himself into the sack. The guards, unaware of this change of bodies and believing it to be the old man, throw Dante's into the water. The flow of blood and water in the death of the old priest is comparable to the flow of blood and water from the side of Jesus when the Roman soldiers pierced him, a phenomenon that always takes place at birth, symbolizing here the birth of a higher consciousness. Eighth, man discovers that his consciousness of being is the inexhaustible treasure of the universe. The day man makes this discovery, he dies as man and awakens as God. Yes, Edmond Dantes becomes the Count of Monte Cristo. Man becomes Christ. Chapter 25, Psalm 23. First, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Second, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Third, he leadeth me beside the still waters. Comment. First, my conscience is my Lord and shepherd. What I am conscious of being are the sheep that follow me. So good a shepherd is my consciousness of being that it has never lost a sheep or thing that I am conscious of being. My consciousness is a calling voice in the wilderness of human confusion, calling all that I am conscious of being to follow me. So well do my sheep know my voice that they have never failed to respond to my call, nor will there come a time when that which I am convinced I am will fail to find me. I am an open door for all that I am to enter. My consciousness of being is Lord and Shepherd of my life. I now know that I will never need proof or lack evidence of what I am aware of being. Knowing this, I will be aware of being great, loving, rich, healthy and all the other attributes I admire. Second, my awareness of being magnifies all that I am aware of being, so that there is always an abundance of what I am aware of being. No matter what it is that of which man is conscious of being, he will find it eternally springing up in his world. The measure of the Lord, man's conception of himself, is always tight, shaken, and overflowing. Third, there is no need to fight for what I am conscious of being, for all that I am conscious of being will be led to me as easily as a shepherd leads his flock to the still waters of a quiet spring. Fourth, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Fifth, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Now that my memory has been restored, that I may know that I am the Lord, and that apart from me there is no God, my kingdom has been restored. My kingdom, which was dismembered the day I believed in powers other than myself, is now fully restored. Now that I know that my consciousness of being is God, I will make right use of this knowledge by becoming conscious of being that which I desire to be. Sixth, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. In the face of apparent opposition and conflict, I will succeed, for I will continue to manifest the abundance I am now conscious of being. My head, consciousness, will continue to overflow with the joy of being God. Seventh, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Yea, Though I walk through all the confusion and changing opinions of men, I shall fear no evil, for I have found that it is conscience that makes confusion. Having restored it in my own case to its rightful place and dignity, I shall, in spite of confusion, manifest what I am now conscious of being, and the confusion itself will echo and reflect my own dignity. Because I am now conscious of being good and merciful, Signs of goodness and mercy are bound to follow me all the days of my life, for I will continue to dwell in the house or consciousness of being God, good, forever. Chapter 26. Gethsemane. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray there. Matthew 26, 36. In the story of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is told a most wonderful mystical romance, but man has failed to see the light of its symbolism and has misinterpreted this mystical union as an agonizing experience in which Jesus pleaded in vain with his Father to change his destiny. Gethsemane is for the mystic the Garden of Creation, the place in consciousness where man goes to realize his defined goals. 
Gethsemane is a compound word meaning to squeeze out an oily substance. Geth, squeeze, and shaman, oily substance. The story of Gethsemane reveals to the mystic in a dramatic symbolism the act of creation. Just as man contains within him an oily substance which, in the act of creation, is squeezed into a likeness of himself, so he has within him a divine principle, his consciousness, which conditions itself as a state of consciousness and, unaided, squeezes or objectifies itself. A garden is a cultivated ground, a specially prepared field, where the seeds that the gardener chooses are planted and cultivated. Gethsemane is such a garden, the place in consciousness where the mystic goes with his objectives properly defined. One enters this garden when man turns his attention away from the world around him and places it on his goals. Man's clarified desires are seeds that contain the power and plans of self-expression and, like the seeds within man, these too are buried within an oily substance, a joyful and grateful mental attitude. When man contemplates being and possessing what he desires to be and possess, he has begun the process of expulsion or the spiritual act of creation. These seeds are squeezed out and planted when man loses himself in a wild and crazy state of joy, consciously feeling and claiming to be that which he once desired to be. The desires expressed or squeezed out result in the passing of that particular desire. Man cannot possess a thing and desire to possess it at the same time. Therefore, as one consciously appropriates the feeling of being the thing desired, this desire to be the thing passes, is realized. The receptive attitude of the mind feeling and receiving the impression of being the thing desired is the fertile soil or womb that receives the seed, definite objective. The seed that is squeezed out of a man grows in the likeness of the man from whom it was squeezed. In the same way, the mystical seed, your conscious affirmation that you are that which until now you wish to be, will grow in the likeness of you, from whom and in whom it is squeezed. Yes, Gethsemane is the cultivated garden of romance, where the disciplined man will press seeds of joy, definite desires, out of himself in his receptive attitude of mind, there to tend and nurture them by consciously walking in the joy of being all that he formerly desired to be. Feel with the great gardener the secret thrill of knowing that things and qualities now unseen will be seen as soon as these conscious impressions grow and mature. Your consciousness is Lord and husband. The conscious state in which you dwell is wife or beloved. This state made visible is your child bearing witness to you, its father and its mother, for your visible world is made in the image and likeness of the state of consciousness in which you dwell. Your world and the fullness of it are neither more nor less than your consciousness defined, objectified. Knowing this to be true, take care to choose well the mother of your children that state of consciousness in which you live your conception of yourself. The wise man chooses his wife with great discretion. He is aware that his children must inherit the qualities of their parents, so he devotes much time and care to the choice of their mother. The mystic knows that the conscious state in which he lives is the choice he has made of a wife, the mother of his children, that this state must in time incarnate itself within his world. Therefore, he is always choosy in his choice, and always claims himself as his highest ideal. He consciously defines himself as that which he wishes to be. When the man realizes that the conscious state in which he lives is the choice he has made of his partner, he will be more careful with his moods and his feelings. He will not allow himself to react to suggestions of fear, lack or any undesirable impressions. Such suggestions of lack could never pass the vigilance of the disciplined mind of the mystic, because he knows that every conscious claim must express itself in due time as a condition of his world, of his environment. Therefore, he remains true to his beloved, to his definite aim, defining himself, vindicating himself, and feeling himself as that which he wishes to express. Let a man ask himself whether his definite aim would be a thing of joy and beauty if it were realized. If his answer is affirmative, then he may know that his choice of bride is a princess of Israel, a daughter of Judah, for every definite objective that expresses joy when realized is a daughter of Judah, the king of praise. Jesus took with him to his hour of prayer his disciples, 
or disciplined attributes of the mind and commanded them to watch while he prayed, that no thought or belief which might negate the realization of his desire might enter his consciousness. Follow the example of Jesus, who, with his desires clearly defined, entered the Garden of Gethsemane, the state of joy, accompanied by his disciples, his disciplined mind, to lose himself in a wild joy of realization. The fixation of his attention on his goal was his command to his disciplined mind to watch and remain faithful to that fixation. Contemplating the joy that would be his in realizing his desire, he began the spiritual act of generation, the act of pressing the mystical seed, his definite desire. In this fixation, he remained, affirming and feeling himself to be that which he, before entering Gethsemane, desired to be, until his whole being, consciousness, was bathed in an oily sweat, joy, akin to blood, life. In short, until his whole consciousness was imbued with the living and sustained joy of being his definite objective. As this fixation is achieved, so that the mystic knows by his feeling of joy that he has passed from his previous state of consciousness to his present consciousness, the Passover or crucifixion is attained. This crucifixion or fixation of the new conscious claim is followed by the Sabbath, a time of rest. There is always an interval of time between the impression and its expression, between the conscious claim and its embodiment. This interval is called Sabbath, the period of rest or of non-effort, the day of burial. To walk impassively in the consciousness of being or possessing a certain state is to keep the Sabbath. The story of the crucifixion beautifully expresses this stillness or mystical rest. We are told that after Jesus cried out, it is finished, he was placed in a tomb, there he remained all the Sabbath. When the new state or consciousness is appropriated so that you feel, by this appropriation, fixed and secure in the knowledge that it is finished, then you too will cry out, it is finished, and you will enter the tomb or Sabbath, an interval of time in which you will walk impassively in the conviction that your new consciousness must rise, become visible. Easter, the day of resurrection, falls on the first Sunday after the full moon in Aries. The mystical reason for this is simple. A defined area will not precipitate in the form of rain until this area reaches the point of saturation. Likewise, the state you inhabit will not express itself until the whole is permeated with the awareness that it is so. It is finished. Your definite goal is the imaginary state, just as the equator is the imaginary line along which the sun must pass to mark the beginning of spring. This state, like the moon, has no light or life of its own, but will reflect the light of consciousness or sun. I am the light of the world, I am the resurrection and the life. As Easter is determined by the full moon in Aries, so also the resurrection of your conscious claim is determined by the full consciousness of your claim, by actually living as this new conception. Most men fail to resurrect their goals because they fail to remain true to their newly defined state until this fullness is attained. If man were mindful of the fact that there can be no Easter or Resurrection Day until after the full moon, he would realize that the state into which he has consciously passed will only express or resurrect itself after he has remained within the state of being his defined objective, until his whole being shudders with the feeling of actually being his conscious claim, by consciously living in this state of being, and only then will the man resurrect or realize his desire. Chapter 27. A Formula for Victory. Every place whereon the sole of your foot shall tread, that have I given unto you. Joshua. 1. 3. Most people are familiar with the story of Joshua capturing the city of Jericho. What they don't know is that this story is the perfect formula for victory, under any circumstances and against all odds. It is recorded that Joshua was armed only with the knowledge that every place he stepped on the sole of his foot would be given to him. That he desired to capture or step on the city of Jericho, but found the walls separating him from the city to be impassable. It seemed physically impossible for Joshua to break through those massive walls and set foot in the city of Jericho. However, he was driven by the promise that, despite the barriers and obstacles that separated him from his desires, if he could set foot in the city, it would be delivered to him. The Book of Joshua, 
further records that instead of fighting this gigantic problem of the wall, Joshua employed the services of the harlot Rahab and sent her as a spy into the city. When Rahab entered her house, which was in the middle of the city, Joshua, who was well protected by the impassable walls of Jericho, blew the trumpet seven times. On the seventh blast, the walls collapsed and Joshua entered the city victoriously. To the uninitiated, this story makes no sense. To the one who sees it as a psychological drama rather than as a historical record, it is most revealing. If we were to follow Joshua's example, our victory would be equally simple. Joshua symbolizes for you, reader, your present state. The city of Jericho symbolizes your definite desire or goal. The walls of Jericho symbolize the obstacles that stand between you and the realization of your goals. The foot symbolizes understanding. Placing the sole of the foot on a definite place indicates fixing a definite psychological state. Rahab, the spy, is your ability to travel secretly or psychologically anywhere in space. Consciousness knows no boundaries. No one can prevent you from psychologically inhabiting any point or any state in time or space. Regardless of the physical barriers that separate you from your goal, you can effortlessly and single-handedly annihilate time, space, and barriers. Thus you can dwell psychologically in the desired state. Thus even if you cannot physically step into a state or a city, you can always psychologically step into any desired state. By psychologically stepping, I mean that you can now in this moment. Close your eyes and after visualizing or imagining a place or state, other than the present one, actually feel that you are in that place or state. You can feel that this condition is so real that when you open your eyes you are surprised to discover that you are not physically there. A harlot, as you know, gives to all men what they ask of her. Rahab, the harlot, symbolizes your infinite capacity to psychologically assume any desirable state, without questioning whether or not you are physically or morally fit for it. Today you can capture the modern city of Jericho or your defined objective if you reenact psychologically this story of Joshua. But to capture the city and realize your desires, you must carefully follow the formula of victory as set forth in this book of Joshua. Here is the application of this victorious formula as revealed today by a modern mystic. First, define your goal, not the way to obtain it, but your goal, pure and simple. Know exactly what it is you desire so that you have a clear mental picture of it. Second, turn your attention away from the obstacles that separate you from your goal and put your thoughts on the goal itself. Third, close your eyes and feel that you are already in the city or state you wish to capture. Remain in this psychological state until you get a conscious reaction of complete satisfaction from this victory. Then, by simply opening your eyes, return to your previous conscious state. This secret journey to the desired state, with its subsequent psychological reaction of complete satisfaction, is all that is needed to achieve total victory. This victorious psychic state will embody itself in spite of all opposition. It has the plan and the power of self-expression. From this point, follow the example of Joshua who, after dwelling psychologically in the desired state, until receiving a complete conscious reaction of victory, did nothing more to achieve this victory than to blow his trumpet seven times. The seventh blast symbolizes the seventh day, a time of stillness or rest, the interval between the subjective and objective states, a period of expectancy or joyful expectation. This stillness is not the stillness of the body, but rather the stillness of the mind, a perfect passivity which is not indolence, but a living stillness born of confidence in this immutable law of consciousness. Those who are unfamiliar with this law or formula for victory, in attempting to still their minds, succeed only in acquiring a quiet tension which is nothing but compressed anxiety. But you, who know this law, will find that after capturing the psychological state that would be yours if you were already victorious and truly entrenched in that city, you will advance toward the physical realization of your desires. You will do so without doubt or fear, in a state of mind fixed in the knowledge of a pre-established victory. You will not fear the enemy, 
because the outcome has been determined by the psychological state that preceded the physical offensive, and all the forces of heaven and earth will not be able to stop the victorious fulfillment of that state. Remain motionless in the psychological state defined as your objective until you feel the thrill of victory. Then, with the confidence born of the knowledge of this law, observe the physical accomplishment of your objective. Stand still and observe the salvation of the law within you.